Mitchell. Segment. Som pre Y nahrával tento segment. Som mal svoj vlohy na to pečiť. Vás prechytenie. A neprší zatiaľ. Uprší. Som sa nechotil nikto nebaviť. Som sa nechotil nikto nebaviť. Keď ľudia začnú verejne prezentovať svoju tuplosť osobne, to je strašné. To je strašné. To je strašné. No, no. Je to ťažká doba. Ľahké už aj nebude nikdy. Ja to najväčšie, že to už nikdy nebude ľahšie. To už bude vždy iba ťažšie. A už toto len vás vládam. Či koľko si budeme napravené. Ako na jednej strane mi to dáva nádej, koľko je som schopný zvládnuť. To už nereálne už nemôžem ho zložiť, neexistuje. Lebo to v živote už nebude ľahšie. To nefunkt, to... To roky vždy iba vždy napreduje. A keď to 30 rokov stále sa iba zhoršuje, nevidím dôvod si mysleť, že zrazu to pôjde dole. Takže to mi môže dávať takú nádeť, že už ma to musí zložiť časom. Že to neexistuje. A nevyzeráš byť nejaký zložený? Ne, alebo ja veľa zvládnem. To je ten najväčší problém, ktorý to je. Si celkom čipého na to všetko. Lebo ja veľa zvládnem, ja som vytrenovaný pičius veľmi. To je najväčší problém, ktorý tu je. Koľko ešte vydržíš? To je tá otázka. Neviem, ale 10 rokov určite si myslím. Jak s prehľadom to povedal. Kriste, páne. Ak im veď sú do 50-ky, sa tu sa. A keď by som... Ja už by som reálne chcel mať 70, 80 rokov byť taký detko. Lebo potom by mi ľudia dali podľa mňa väčší pokoj. Potom by sa podľa mňa menej púšťali do mňa. Do detko sa až tak nepúšťajú, si myslím. Počúvaj, jaké máš vlastne teraz nápoje? Max, Max, obi dva sú duši Max. A to sú jaké príchute? Ja neviem, jeden je tropický a druhý je nejaký, neviem, červený. A je to lepšie ako to melónového žvástala, čo si pil? Melónové, melónové, ne melónové, boli tučný topky, ne? Máme tam, že si mal kedysi Hello melónový. Melónové boli topky, melón, citrón, to boli topky. To je jasné. Melón, citrón boli topky. Máme si kúpať sa to, čo je najľahšie, najlacnejšie. V danom momente. Lebo ono je to v podstate jedno. Čo? Že teraz sú najlacnejší títa? Supermaxovia či sa volajú? Je to boli najlacnejšie. Na čo sa pýtaš, keď to vieš asi, keď som ich zobral. Píko, vždy zobraj najlacnejšie, ideme ďalej. Však dobre, ale niekedy nebral najlacnejšie, lebo niektoré boli, že vzlávi, že sa to oplatilo viacej. No tak to znamená, že boli najlacnejšie. Ja neviem. Nie, mohlo byť aj také, že ja neviem, že sú 250, ja neviem, poviem, že melónovci a sú zľave na 8, zo euro 15 na 80 centov a sú maxovia, ktorí stoja 70 centov, tak sa viacej oplatia melónovci, keďže sú chutnejší, nie? Tak 10 centov nehaj rolu, to už je v podstate to isté. Takže to je v podstate to isté. 10 centov, či sú drahšie, alebo nie, to už je to isté. No a platí sa za tú plechovku, či nie? Lebo viem, že na melónovej sa neplatilo za plechovku, preto sa aj väčšinu brávali, iba melónovi. 
Ja neviem. Aj tak sa neberie iba jeden trúl, lebo môžeš objednať iba 24 kusov z jedného, preto sa berie viacej. Už je to úplne jedno. Dovolať len 24 kusov zobrať z jedného. 24 kusov. Aké zri, aha, to je extrém. Čo je extrém? Čo? Iba 24 kusov. Nie, nie, nie. Že to zvláda, že keď si to vrát, tak prepočítaj, že dva nápoje, že trochu čipsom, že čo si vláda. Uva. Ale to nie je najväčší problém ani. Podľa mňa najviac ma devastuje ten spánok. Si myslím. Ani nie je to jedlo. Čak ale na vás. Ha. No ale aj tak by si mi... Neviem, no však je to ťažoba teraz tým, sa, že sa s nimi nechce stretnúť. Ale ja si myslím, že, že keby ráno objednávajú sa... A ne, nemôžu sa, ty gospy. A ja on takisto nemá čo. To to je ešte. A večer, večer susedia sú hore? Chodia po bytovke? Ty koľko si to by som spal? Ty si myslíš, že keď budem povedať ako tak lepšie a spať dve hodiny denne, že to bude OK? Nie, však tak okolo desiatej. No, ako ty si myslíš, že čo? Bež, bežne chodia o jedenastej, o polnoci, von, von, venčí psov a podobne. Ako <laughs> neviem, ty zaujdaš na tieto klasiky? Tak ja bývam už roky v rodinnom dome, vieš. Je... Tučko môže hoci, kedy si povedať, že ide v noci sa o, ovlažiť von, zapáliť si cigaretu, popíjať to ako vonku. Na čerstvom vzduchu si zapáliť. Jeho, jeho matka to robila bežne. Môže to byť aj on. Sa nemá zaručené nič. Tu časovo to neobídeš nejako. Oni môžu o 5. o 4. Oni hoci, kedy môžu ísť von. Tu neexistuje časový Dobre, ani do... priestor. Dobre, teraz ma napadla vec. Myslíš, že by sa to nedalo fixnúť tým, že by si si dal kuklu? Ale ma jesť to nehovoriť kuklu tým. Čo? Seriózne sa te pýtam. Ako máš kuklu? Kto by ťa stopol, keď máš kuklu? Kristi, pán. Už mám ale myslí vám ani toto kuklu tým. Ešte viac šokujúce. Tak snažíme sa fixnúť, aby si sa nestretol so susedom. Si myslíš, že tí ľudia sú zaostali? Oni aj tak budú veriť. Aha. Myslíš si, že sú dosť? Pozor, ne, nebolo takéto kokotiny. To nie je riešenie. Riešenie tu nie je. Riešenie iba také, že sa bude menej jesť. To je iné riešenie. Ja rozmýšľam už teraz, že už ani nápoj nebude možné, keď tieto minú objednať ďalšie. Pravdepodobne to nebude možné ani to. Dobre, ale tak to asi zomreš čo skoro, keď nebudeš nič jesť. Nie? Áno, hod keď sme optimisti. Tak ja neviem, koľko ľudské telo vydrží. Ja mám dosť čipsov stále. Stále mám dosť čipsov. Mám ešte mlieka. Ako, ako posledné štosy. A neodchádzajú nejako z toho orgány, alebo také toľko cvičíš, vieš, nič nevieš. To už je ti niečo odísť. Tak jem niečo. Moc nie. Niečo musím jesť. Niečo musím dať do úzne, nejaké tu iný materiál. Než by to bolo ťažké. Problém je, že keď sa ti stvrkne nejaký masívny žalúdok, tak si v prdeli. Tam je finish. To je dobré. Ako nejako zomať musíš. Aj. Však áno, však nejako zomrieť musíš, ale, ale vieš, ako to je so štelverkom. Ja, ja, ako, ja neviem, ako to posledné, čo sa bojíme, že ja zomriem. Ako sa je úplne. To je, to ja čo sa bál, že ja neviem, že ľudia dosť tomu robí.
Ale mňa boc nepustí zomrieť. <laughs> to neexistuje. Na to, na to sa nemám príliš dobre. Väčšinou zomrejú tí, ktorí sa majú na istej úrovni dobre. Alebo sa aspoň mali. Alebo, alebo aspoň, aspoň vo svojom mozgu cítia dobre. Že oni sa nemusia dobre mať reálne. Ale keď si spokojný, keď, keď tvoj mozog to vníma, že ti je fajn, tak ty mám najväčšie šance je zomrať. Reálne ani miliardár by nezomrel, keby trpel, keby sa mu zdálo, že má to piče, mám iba 10 biliónov, to je úplne hovno. A keby mal z toho depresie, že si má iba 10 biliónov, zlé mu je, vracel by z toho. He? Ani taký biliónár by nezomrel. Proste tu ide o to, o tú mentalitu, ako vnímaš svoj život. Nie ani čo máš, ani ako reálne sa máš, ale o to, ako tvoj mozog vníma, ako sa máš. Lebo či boli tí milionári, ktorí, ja neviem, mal 10 miliónov, stratil 5 miliónov a spáchal samovraždu, lebo to neuniesol, že stratil polku svojho majetku. Aj? Takže toto je vo veci. <laughs> to je... Tí, ktorí sa majú dobre, tí majú najväčšiu šancu, že môžu niečo pochytiť. Čo mňa pochytí? To by musel zabezpečiť, že ma niečo pochytí a potom, aby som sa pozeral na to, aká bieda nastala po mne. Čo je. Môže to spraviť, samozrejme. Že zomrem a budem vidieť, čo sa deje bez mňa. To by bola tvrdá káva. A to sa nedá obísť. Dovej, ja ne- neobídem isté veci. Ja neobídem isté veci. To je dôvod, prečo robím to, čo robím. To je dôvod, prečo jem tak, ako jem. A ten dôvod je ten, že ak to robiť nebudem, riskujem oveľa väčšie problémy. Ne? Ja sa nemôžem stretnúť s kokotským človekom. Tam riskujem oveľa väčšie problémy, ako menej jesť. Nedal by ste. Musím vyhýbať ľuďom na, na celej frekvencii. Není neriešené.
and um, what well, well, so here we are. So um, you'll notice that uh, we've got um, interesting over here. So I, what I've done is I've looked up uh, one uh, article about a, a, a reasonably common uh, current uh, Ukraine-related news item, which is the alleged meeting between Putin and the head of the Wagner Group, who either rebelled against or mutinied or stayed, tried to stay the truth. Who knows really what was going on? Nobody really knows. Um, and uh, so there's the there's the news item. And here, you know, as you can see, that it was covered by 278 different news outlets, and this many were right-leaning in the opinions of, uh, not just of Ground News, in the opinion of various other bodies that assess uh, newspapers um, and other news outlets. Uh, so that some are left-leaning, some are right-leaning, some are centrist. And if you want to get a breakdown of that, you can look at that and look at all the various uh, news outlets and see maybe that there's a strange blind spot. Maybe the news item is being covered by one side, but not the other. So that in itself is information, isn't it? Which you know, sets things in, in context. And then you might want to delve a little deeper and look into the ownership of those various news sources. Perhaps uh, it's a, a state-sponsored uh, news outlet, and that's likely to introduce bias, isn't it? Or perhaps it's uh, owned by one particular wealthy individual, um, or whatever. You can look it up, and you can you can dive into and get a bit more detail, should you so wish. And then, how factually accurate is this likely to be? Now, Ground News is not a fact-checking service. Um, all it does is it looks at other fact-checking services and looks at how they rate various news sources, and if they all agree that a news source even though it may be right-leaning, is at least factual, but it's probably factual, so it gets a high rating. Uh, so there's high, mixed, and low. And it's interesting to notice that the broadsheets in Britain, the broadsheets, the Guardian, which is sort of a bit left-leaning, and the Telegraph, which is a bit right-leaning, both have a mixed reputation for factual accuracy. That's 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 not impressive. That's not good. Should we, should we do an effort, both of you? Uh, anyway, so you get all those sort of details to go on. So now you can start forming a picture in your mind, things perhaps a little bit more nuanced, a little bit more comprehensive. And um, you, know, you may feel that you might actually get a better grasp on a, a topic. Um, and uh, it's interesting when you start looking at the actual individual articles. By the way, at the top there is a summary uh, of all the various articles written by artificial intelligence. Um, so given, it shouldn't be that biased, should it, given that it's based on lots and lots of articles written by lots and lots of people. So that should sort of iron the bias out. But that's an interesting use of artificial intelligence, isn't it? Uh, how well will that, how useful will that prove? I don't know, but it's an interesting use of it. Um, anyway, I'm pleased that you've got the various articles themselves. And I'm fascinated to see just how often the headlines and text are suspiciously similar or even word for word identical. You see the same news items being just reprinted by lots and lots of sources. Yeah, that's fine, we trust that. Woof, just goes out there. It's not actually produced by them, it's being syndicated. Um, so um, you can search for different news items, you can put in various filters. One of the most useful ones is, is it behind a paywall? Um, and uh, you can look at how the left is looking at it, how the right is looking. Oh, yeah, by the way, the left and right. Look, look over here. You notice that the, on, the, on the right wing, things are in red, and on the left wing, things are in blue. That's because it's got the top. I had it in American print. So let's change that and make it sort of British or international or just anywhere else other than the USA, frankly. And there you go. Now it's, now it's the right way around. Now, everyone around the world associates the color red with socialism. You know, to keep the red flag flying here. Even the Americans used to say, better dead than red, didn't they? And yet, if you go to Wikipedia, this association of red with the Republican, which is thought of meant to be the right wing, although, frankly, the, the Republicans and the Democrats are both further to the right than almost any party in any other civilized nation, but never mind. Um, they, uh, yeah, just only in 2000 did they start associating red with the Republicans, which I find quite, quite bizarre. Anyway. USA, sort yourselves out, get it right, and, and the dates as well, day, month, year, it's very simple. Anyway, um, so you can choose to uh, follow a topic on the site, and the right, yeah, hang on, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm giving you a suspiciously large amount of detail, aren't I, about one particular website. Am I, am I a biased source, do you think? Who owns me? Well, actually, 
I'm being paid. I'm a paid lackey of Brown News. Another way of putting it is that Brown News has very generously sponsored me to tell you about it. It's a service uh, which you can uh, find in a link in the description, in a link appearing on your screen. Also, it should be in the top pinned comment. And uh, if you uh, want to have a, a look at the site and, and look at all its features and give it a go for a while, well, you can by using uh, the links uh, there I just mentioned, and you'll get 30% off if you go to it uh, that way. And so, yeah, Brown News, it's one possible way that uh, we could become more rowdy consumers of news and perhaps, you know, in the future, uh, debates on various topics could become just that little bit more civilized. Wouldn't that be nice? Well, I thought to myself, I'm going to come to Ukraine, but I'm not going to lie. I'm going to tell the truth about everything I can do and everything I don't know. Correct. So I'm, I'm around all these guys. And ex, most of them were British. There was a couple of Finns living in this house. Mm -hmm. um, Ex-army, yeah, I've been to Iraq, Afghanistan, what were you? Oh, I was a dragoon, I was in the rifles, I was in the, the whatever. Um, and I said, well, that's not me. You know what I mean? Like, I could never, I'm not good enough to be with these guys. You know, I'll, I'll probably get them killed because I change a magazine two seconds slower than they do. Like, this is going on in my head. Mm -hmm. um, the Swedes had come the next day because... Uh, Apparently, the Swedes they were waiting for, uh, they were making plans about plans about plans, mm. and they were going to set up a staging camp in Poland. Um, so the Swedish guys I came with said, yeah, yeah, we're, we're coming to Lviv. Um, we were all waiting there for days. We, we had nowhere to go. Mm. We, know, we knew some guys that were at the secret place who had been to Kiev. And like, what's what's it like in Kiev? Oh, it's mental, mate. It's all going on there. It's going off. There's drones flying over, and this is blowing up. And I'm like, okay. But at the same time, what did I sign up for? Mm. Um, a few days later, um, right away, it had occurred to me that there might be some people there not telling the truth about Kiev or their backgrounds before they ever come to Ukraine. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know who was who. So what I thought I would do, um, the man who hosted the house, Paul, he, he was doing humanitarian things. Like he had a couple of vans that would bring food and supplies to mm. places. Um, and I thought, well, maybe that would be a good thing for me so I won't get in the way of the soldiers, you know. Um, my Swedish friends that I come with and I quite like, mm. and I trust, um, they made contact with a man through Instagram which come join hospitalers. And I was like, what's that? Oh, it's a combat medical battalion. I was like, wow, that sounds really cool. Um, yeah, we're gonna go do that. And I said, well, I would like to do that, but uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I'd be a burden or not. Um, because I don't have all these super underwater night fighter, Chuck Norris skills, basically. Right. You know Chuck, right? Oh, oh intimately, and they're, they're vital uh, for certain infiltration, but not really as a medic. If the band needs some, someone up, my fighting skills. <laughs> I didn't know these things, but um, right. what happened, uh, I had a chance to do a humanitarian convoy with the guy who was hosting us. And uh, where it was to go was to go to Kharkiv. Okay, so th this is the beginning of the war, and Khark Lviv's here, and, and Kharkiv's like over by Russia. Yeah. Um, and I thought about it. Nobody wanted to do it. Uh, a couple people wanted to do it, mm -hmm. and I said I'd like to do that. And someone's like, "What do you mean? You know, like that's crazy. You know, you don't have you don't have maps. You don't have intel. You don't." I said, "Well, apparently there's been a guy like heard from a guy. He went there, and you don't go the normal way, or that's Russian. You're dead. Mm -hmm. But if you go all the way down south and you come, like it's about a sixty-hour drive. You'll uh, thirty-five out sixty, seventy hours round trip." Mm -hmm. um, You'll get there. And I said to myself, I says, I, I have to do that. And uh, the reason I had to do that, because that, in my mind, that was as farthest as in the country. It doesn't get any further than Kharkiv. Mm -hmm. But if I can do that and, and it works out good and we, we live mm -hmm. and we don't die, um, that would be a good idea. You know, like then I, mentally I could do anything in Ukraine if I could just get over that hurdle. So that's why I chose to go to Kharkiv. Right, so you actually picked a big hurdle to start off with. Yeah. But why didn't you join the International Brigade? Isn't that the more, most obvious thing for someone who's not Ukrainian to do? Well, 
we heard a lot of rumors about about him, and we heard a lot of bad things. Um, about a day, the day before I left Sweden mm -hmm. to go to Poland to go to UK, um, there was a town called Yerevan, and in Yerevan, uh, apparently the Russians dropped some missiles, and and I think like fifty foreigners died. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Americans, British, all sorts, and and obviously on board amounts of Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, in one of our signal chat groups uh, from from Sweden, there was one guy who was actually in Yerevan, and and he was giving like muddled information. Like, uh, I ran away from the camp that night uh, after the explosion. We, we were all separated, but I came back the next morning, and uh, then I was being arrested for desertion. That that's what he said. Mm. I said, well, that doesn't sound very nice. Um, when I was in Lviv. With all these guys, they would they would uh, like these super commando guys at the secret place. Mm -hmm. uh, they were talking about the Georgian Legion. I I'd never heard of the Georgian Legion, or, or, or I didn't know who was who. Right. And they said they they were going there and they were giving them one magazine per rifle, you know. And and some of them were saying, yeah, I I've been to Iraq, Afghanistan. I don't mind dying for a good call, but this is bullshit. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, yeah, that's fair enough. Um, but again. I didn't know what was true or not, but from what I what I seen of this legion, uh, I thought maybe, what do I have to offer there? That that was that was the main figure. What do I have to offer? Because I'm not one of these special forces guys. Like everybody there was special forces. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? All these guys, or they'd been in special units, uh, particularly the Americans. Um, but I bought into all of that. Like, well, that's not me. You know, so what could I contribute? So that's that's why I didn't want to join the Legion. I didn't want to let anyone down. You know, so I thought maybe humanitarian, mm -hmm. and and I'll see where it goes. Um, that was one of the that was one of that was one of the most haphazard experiences in my life. From the paint. Picture you paint, I get the impression that it was pretty haphazard for everyone, really. Well, um, the problem, I understand the military very well as a, as a principle that we're not a democracy and mm -hmm. we have a leader and we have a structure. Um, but when you're dealing with purely civilian context, you, more personalities come into play. Mm -hmm. So we had a convoy of one van and a car, which seemed to serve no purpose, this car, because it had nothing in it but people. To go all the way to Kharkiv with, with a van full of uh, used clothing um, that I would never want, mm -hmm. um, diapers, and I think dried pasta. Uh, so, so this was a van half loaded full of this, mm -hmm. uh, and we were to go somewhere outside of Kharkiv. Um, and it seemed very bizarre to me at the time. Like I didn't have armored plates. Uh, some somebody loaned me and said. But even driving around the Viv, they were wearing armored plates, they were wearing helmets, and uh, they were getting photos of themselves, like like selfie photos, in armor plates and helmets, and, and it seemed to me really bizarre because nothing was happening. Mm. Um, we didn't get to go to Kharkiv, it, it was somewhere outside of Kharkiv, and uh, someone told us that uh, there were civilians trying to get out of Kharkiv. Um, the boys in the van, me, another Canadian, a Frenchman, we said, yeah, we would like to go do that. Mm -hmm. But the people in the car said, you can't do that. You know, you're not legally insured. And, and I, I said, not legally insured? I, I, I don't think that would be a concern in the war. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it was a big dilemma. Uh, I became really disheartened with them. I, I found out all they wanted to do. They just wanted to get pictures outside of this hospital in this town in their armor giving out these things and I, I didn't like these uh, I didn't understand that you have to provide pictures you know to get funding and things at the time but okay it, it seemed very much like um, look at look at how great we were yeah um, on the way back um, the, there was a bit of a, a bit of an awkwardness between us all there was a there was a this Canadian man who drove in the car who, who knew everything you know he was a he, he'd been helping Ukraine since 2016, um, and, and he brought us, he had, he had a credit card for some NGO, um, mm -hmm. I don't know what the name of it was, and he took us all to a very fancy restaurant. And, and I was like, 
I didn't think there'd be a fancy restaurant so far east in Ukraine. Mm. And I think he probably spent about $150 on food, which is a lot of money in Ukraine, mm -hmm. and congratulating everyone on, on what a job we did. Um, but delivering like used clothing and dried pasta, and um, it was very, very awkward. Mm. Um, when we left and, and started heading back uh, towards Lviv, uh, there's a town called Poltava we had to go through. Mm -hmm. um, and what happened? I, I decided I was quite tired. I'll sleep in the back of the van. You know, I've got a sleeping bag and I can sleep in a moving vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, but the van stopped along the way and I thought, oh, we're, we're going to get diesel, we're going to get petrol or something. I'm half asleep, I'm half awake, and the sliding door on the back of the Renault slides open and then there's an AK in my face. And I was like, I've never had a gun pointed to me in my life. Uh, actually, maybe once with the police, uh, I, I don't know. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe not. I don't think so. But uh, but at the time, it felt like a first. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Um, and, and he was a big man, you know, with like like hands the size of shovels and, and a big ginger beard. And, you know, mm -hmm. I, I've never, never been a fan of ginger beards. Uh, <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, but I, I was in my sleeping bag and I looked and I said, I'm, I'm just going to, and he's like, okay, okay. so mm -hmm. I'm going to get out of my sleeping bag very, very slowly, as slowly as possible, you know, mm -hmm. and um, I point to my boots and uh, I was like, and he's like, and, and I was like, what is happening? I get out of the vehicle. Um, we've been pulled over at a checkpoint. You know, they, they've got these block posts everywhere. Uh, the car in front of us, we were traveling with a, a little car, uh, a, a beat up piece of van, mm -hmm. um, and everybody was pulled out. The car people on the one side, um, and the three guys in the van. They put us up, hands up, on the van. Yeah. Uh, and I'm kind of, I don't want to turn my head back too far, but I'm quite curious what's, mm -hmm. what's going on behind me. And there's these three, four soldiers, like in mismatching uniforms, and and everything, and then they cock their bolts on their rifles, and, and and I'm watching, and I'm a little bit scared, if I'm honest with you. <laughs> Only a little bit. Yeah, I yeah, think yeah. You, I think you had justification for being there more than a little. Um, but I'm really curious. I don't want to turn my head all the way, because yeah. I want to be as compliant as possible, mm -hmm. but I want to see out of my periphery, and, and one of the guys is shaking a lot. He's shaking, and I, I'm thinking, you know, we, we've got total advantage here, you know, we are no threat. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what happened, um, but they took our passports, they took our ID, um, they got us away from the vehicle, keeping both vehicles probably separate. And uh, after a while, you know, they let us put our hands down, they had one, the gun had lowered. Mm -hmm. um, I said, you know what, I'm going to have a cigarette now. And by the way, I decided to start smoking after 10 years, uh, my first day in Ukraine. You know, oh. so, so I was well into the habit by then. We're, we're not quite two weeks into the war. and. I said, I'm going to have a cigarette. And, and the guy beside me, don't you dare. I said, you're not my father. I, I can do whatever I want. They'll tell me what I can and cannot do. Mm -hmm. um, what it turned out to be, our, our guide in the front vehicle was a girl, a Ukrainian girl. She had a Russian stamp on her passport. Wow. Yeah. So we all get taken to jail. Okay. Uh, they've got enough cops there. They, they mm -hmm. take our vehicles. Um, but it's not a police station. It's a, it's a hotel. Um, you see, the police had moved out of the police stations because of missile attacks and all these sort of things. Right. Um, so it, it, it's a hotel. Um, not a nice hotel, but a, mm -hmm. a, a, a nicer than a police station. Um, I don't know what's going to happen. They, they've taken our phones, they've taken our passports, they've taken mm -hmm. everything. Um, I don't have social media. Remember that? Mm -hmm. um, I didn't have social media the first couple of months of the war. The police, this is, um, I don't know if I'd say this, but yeah, okay, tell the truth. Um, I do have on my phone uh, at the time Tinder. Right. Okay, things weren't great at home at the time, don't judge me. Uh, all the other boys were getting Tinder mm -hmm. uh, and just swiping all the time at the secret place and everywhere. Right. Um, so I just thought, you know, I'd swipe on beautiful girls and, and uh, you know, when I'm bored, mm -hmm. um, I have no social media, I have nothing on my phone. Uh, one police officer speaks English um, 
and I'm the only one without social media in, in this modern day. Mm -hmm. And uh, they started, the police started accusing me of being a sex tourist. You're a sex tourist. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, I was quite embarrassed because uh, I, I didn't have any sexual inclinations to come into Ukraine. I think you would have picked somewhere else, wouldn't you, to be a sex tourist? I would think Thailand or something. Yeah, much more convenient. Yeah, 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 yeah. Although I could understand maybe pre-war time, maybe maybe Ukraine might be the place for this sort of thing. Maybe, you know, like beautiful women, whatever, and what have you. Um, but no, I, I was not a sex tourist. Um, we were held for about three, four hours, and uh, one of the Canadian boys, the, he, he went through the whole... Uh, hysteria, manic depression, uh, of being friendly with the police, to, to crying. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was the first one to get my telephone back uh, through all the all the interviews, and uh, I rang this man Paul in Lviv. Mm -hmm. um, now I do understand leadership principles from the army. Uh, he said, "Where are you? We're trying to get a hold of you." I said, "Paul, please listen to me very carefully. Um, everybody is okay. Everybody is okay." But we've all been arrested. Um, I believe we're all going to be free because I I've just finished and I've got my telephone, so mm -hmm. I think everything's going to be okay. Uh, I can't talk now. I'll ring you later to let you know. And uh, I thought that would be okay. It's like you need to tell me now, uh, Paul. I had to go. Fuck you. I was like, whoa, this is not the this is not the leadership I'm expecting. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm telling you, you're the leader of us all. That, that everybody's had a problem, but we're all okay. Mm -hmm. I'll update you later. Um, yeah, the long and the short of it, um, a couple of us became quite disenchanted with this humanitarian work. Mm -hmm. um, as soon as I got back to Lviv, I contacted the Swedes, uh, the Swedish guys who went, went to Kiev to join Hospitalers, whatever the hell that was. Mm -hmm. And I, I asked them, I said, um, I think I'd like to take a chance. I'd like to maybe try to join the Hospitalers with you. And they said, uh, well, let us talk to someone here. We, we've got Oleg. I was like, who's Oleg? Um, there's a lot of Olegs in Ukraine. Several, I've been told. Yeah, yeah. Um, they called me back the next day. And they said, how soon can you get here? Mm -hmm. I said, well, may maybe a day or two. I think I think I can take a train. And they said, OK, we'll come. Um, and uh, I'm back at the secret place. Uh, and at the secret place, there's some of the same people that have been there. They're just sitting in Lviv and uh, they're doing something. They're going to go do something. They've not done anything. They don't know what to do. And um, I I kind of felt like the secret place was maybe not the place to be. Mm. You know, that it was kind of it was kind of like purgatory. Right. Not always full of people with the highest of initiative. Not the highest of initiative. A lot of storytellers, characters. Um, a lot of swiping uh, right. A lot of swipe. Yeah, there was a lot of swiping going on there back in those days. Um, no, what, what I decided to do, uh, I booked a train ticket, uh, an overnight, uh, or sorry, an all day, all day train to Kiev, mm -hmm. and I was terrified. Um, I was terrified because, to me, I thought Kiev would be like Stalingrad. So the trains were still running as normal uh, to where the fighting was happen happening, because I would have thought that with modern munitions, taking out a railway line uh, would have been reasonably easy. I thought that too, and, you know, and I'm very grateful we're fighting Russia and not America. Um, no insult, not to, not to, um, you know, the Russians have caused a lot of damage there, but there's some things, there's some things that the Russians never seem to do in the war that I would have thought, mm -hmm. why don't they just blow up all the bridges? Why don't they blow up all the railways? And then they can... But anyway, I'm on a, I'm on a train. And I'm on a train that's a big moving target. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm traveling during the day. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking out the windows. And I've, I've seen uh, I've seen what looked like an oil derrick on fire. Uh, you know, the thick, you know that thick black smoke like in Kuwait? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Well, I yeah, yeah, I see, I see things like that, and I said, I don't, couldn't tell you where that was. Are, are you on the last of the empty train? Are you on a train no, full of soldiers? No, the train is probably half full of civilians, uh, or, or maybe a third full. Of people going to? Going to Kiev. Right. And maybe a stop in between, like Vivna or somewhere, that is somewhere on the map. Mm -hmm. um, I, I didn't know, I said, how, how is this going to work? Um, 
So I was on there for quite a few hours. Uh, I, I, it, it couldn't go directly its normal route to Kiev. They, they had the birds apparently had come from the south. Mm -hmm. um, but when I arrived there, um, everything was pitch black. Uh, there was no lights, there was no street lights, even getting off the train, because it, it's not like trains here in Britain. Um, the platform, there's there's a bit more of a gap in the dark, mm -hmm. and the hall seems to be just that much more of consequence. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Help. And you're wearing a burden. And I'm wearing a burden, and health and safety didn't really seem to be a concern there, like like in, in, in the modern Western world. Mm -hmm. But the thing was, I found out we, we couldn't leave the train station. Um, Kiev uh, had a curfew. Had a martial law, and uh, I don't know who explained it to me, but some person spoke English. The authorities did not. Mm -hmm. um, I um, I was told by by this man, um, we have to stay here tonight. Um, we can't leave until I, I think five or six in the morning. Then the, then the curfew is over. He says, but come with me. Uh, if you come upstairs, uh, I think he'd done this run a couple times before. Mm -hmm. It's nicer to sleep up there on that floor. I said, okay, well, let's, let's, I'll follow you. Mm -hmm. and, and he said, well, along the way, come with me here because there's there's these old babushkas who they've got soup and coffee and, and, and they'll feed you. And I said, yeah, this is, this is nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but all night I'm paranoid, you know, somebody's going to rob me, somebody's going to steal my bergen. I didn't sleep too well. And, and there, there was air raid sirens and this sort. Mm -hmm. But I, I knew the next morning I had a location I had to get to, and surprisingly enough, you know, I've got a Ukrainian SIM card, the phone service is working perfectly fine, mm -hmm. and I thought I'd go for a walk in the morning, and I'd, I'd walk to, um, I'd walk to where I was supposed to go, to where, supposedly where our base was. Mm -hmm. um, but this nice chap, who I, I slept beside the night before, who was so helpful, he was walking with me, and, uh, and he was following me, or, or supposedly on the same way. But I, I was scared in my head that I, I need to get rid of him. I can't go to where I'm going because he could be a Russian spy. Mm -hmm. See, this was a big thing early in the war. Uh, I can't, uh, I can't, I don't know the difference between a Ukrainian or a Russian. I got rid of that fella. Um, and I had to go wait on a park bench somewhere. That's where the location I was given. Um, and uh, Oleg would come along to collect me. Yeah, Oleg. Um, I don't know who Oleg is. But uh, all probably, I got into the airport around six in the morning, probably around ten in the morning. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry, John. Ah. Oh, I'm going to
Какъв е хушка, бе, какъв е хушка да е фута. Ето хушка, ето фута, ето малка. Ето малка. Ой, съм спрямен да си вълфува за спрямовите. Анкета ли съм? Ja sam tam nisi... Collect cats. Relic cats. Purify more of cats daily operations. Good unit. Kill a bull miner. Crop. Black Italian junk. Wanna buy some junk? So it bought one pit on it. She did the missus out in Kuhn. Out in Kuhn.
Ďalší môj game je toho fix som chcel. Dobre. Nie sa nechce sa mi toto robiť. Wow, I'm so good shit. No big of the enemies here. What are you collecting here? I found the photo. Eat Nico Khan and Mesa. And the photo went down. That's a big of each song. The documents. I'll post a yard stack fucker. Počkaj, je to koľko tam sa leží robiť kukuricu? Pitko mi leží robiť kukuricu. Thank <laughs> you. 
Aby som ich zdajala tam. Sa na to je? Neviem. Smaker. No, tieto misie nie sú len nieco veľké. Nie sú len veľké. Sú len nejaké problematické. Predpovede. Chcem robiť skupnice, ja bol čo na to potrebujem. Čiže bolovať si vodu. Píče. What am I jumping? Koľko? Dva z nova stačí. Koľko? What's the boy on?
Kde sa mi tak dávať? Čo sa nebojte zastaviť Black Titanium v balku? Čo sa zastaviť Black Titanium v balku? Čiže je to junk. Musím to otvoriť, možno to aktivovať.
was a big deal up in Fargo. This other moment. Voda, kropy, denné operácie, volanie. Ale za pohodu. Ja som ešte niečo mať. Áááá, nie som spravil som nejaké. Na OLED pane pojde do Swedish Voice. Áno, to je dobrý test pre show. Yes, yes, yes. A ja mi dám veľký hug, you know, like, and, and OLED was like, hi. And I was like, OK, you know, that's, that's fair, mm-hmm. that's fair. Um, they said, yeah, yeah, we can get you in. They're, they're not, uh, they're not taking people right now, but, uh, but they'll take you because we're on a team and, And, and I'm, I'm walking in uh, to where our base was. Mm-hmm. It's actually quite a prominent church in here, uh, like, a, like a monastery. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I wasn't expecting that. And right, now, as soon as you say that, yeah. I, I, I think, you, I, are you telling the enemy now something that we would like to know? Um, is is that not potentially a, a secret thing? I'm sure maybe about 10, 10, 12 months ago they would have liked to know than that. Right. Um, but I, I try not to get too hung up on that because... Um, i just, um, there's a lot of things in Ukraine that are on the TV, on the internet, that don't make sense to me. I, I try to apply my own common sense. Mm-hmm. Um, but but that it's, it's well documented uh, that that monastery was our, was our base at one time. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. So it, it's, it's, quite, it's quite bizarre going through the gates of this Eastern European church with a the, with the golden dome and, mm-hmm. you know, these fantastic colors of blue. And uh, and then the priests who walk around with those big hats like oh and and then seeing soldiers everywhere, but Oleg stops me before we go in. He's like, um, um, "What is your role?" I said, like, what, "What do you mean?" He says, "What will you do here?" And I, I thought, well, uh, you know, medical battalion. Or I could be an ambulance driver. Mm-hmm. You know, I used to drive transit sprinters that sort. He said, "No, no, 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 no. Uh, we do not have any drivers. Uh, would you like to be a gunner?" we have some gunner positions that have come available and i'm like okay come available is quite a sinister phrase in that context isn't it i didn't inquire i didn't inquire and i said um okay i'll mm-hmm. do it but my friend nico uh who was one of the swedish boys um he said to me oh hey bro i'm a gunner too cool and i'm like uh, he'd already been in um He'd been in Kiev, which I later, I later learned about like the Buchas, the airplanes. He'd been back and forth between all of this stuff. Right. Um, oh, you're going to be a gunner too? Cool, bro. Um, I was like, yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> it was a big, um, for me, a big part of the fear was dispelled because my friends I came with mm-hmm. had done already what I was going to do. Yeah. And they were still alive. So, so that was uh, that was half my fear gone. Mm-hmm. But when I got there, uh, you know, they, they said, "Yeah, come with me. We'll get you into a room, and, and, and we're going into like this side building on the church." Um, yeah, come on up the stairs, and, and they had all these rooms in the church with bunk beds. Mm-hmm. Some of them were not even just two bunk beds; they were three bunk beds high. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, it's. Uh, I was like, okay, this is this is my new home. They're like, yep. Yeah. Leave your bags here. You can stay with us. You don't want to stay down there, and that where they mix it all the riffraff. Oh, okay. Um, and I thought right away, I said, "We've got nothing for you now, but just wait." And and I was very compliant. Mm-hmm. But but then I thought, well, you know, maybe I'll go outside the river and smoke it. You know, and I'll just I'll smoke. I'll listen. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll observe. Um, there's always people smoking in Ukraine, just like any army, really. Yeah. 
what else are you going to do? And there's, you know, there's bombs going off in the distance. I didn't know how far they could be 10 kilometers, 20 kilometers. Um, but uh, there's all these Ukrainians, oh, yeah, but then I hear the English voices off to the side. So maybe I, you know, edge more over there. And mm-hmm. it's like, oh, that's an American, that's British. Oh, that's a South African. Oh, that's a, uh, some sort of European. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would, I would listen and I would, I would talk to some of them, but, but I would try to listen more. Um, because I remember the secret place and all the characters there and what they would say and what they would do. Mm-hmm. Um, I was, I don't want to use the word sizing them up, but I was just basically trying to figure out who was full of shit and not. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll just watch, I'll listen. Um, Kosi se dočipil. Kosi se dočipil. Ah. My Swedish friends were quite busy. Uh, they were they they, uh, they were on an ambulance crew. Uh, so so there would be a driver, a doctor, paramedic, Chipo. a gunner, mm-hmm. and they would drive basically like sprinter vans, transit vans, painted green. You know, and and they would go to Bucha, to Irpin for two three days, and then the ambulance would come back to resupply. But to wash it out. Um, yeah, yeah. No, some of them, some of them had holes in them. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, like, like the Ukrainians are going, "Oh, see what happened to that one? He's all right." Um, but, but to me, this was hey, what's what's happening here. Hmm. Um, but it was a big reassurance that my friends, uh, my friends were going there and coming back. And one of the Swedes we came with, I'd never seen him at all. Apparently, he was trapped somewhere for about, I, I think, eight nine days. So, so it's like, wow, he must really be in the shit. Um, this is a very interesting place. Um, there have been foreigners there for, for a couple of weeks now, mm-hmm. uh, joining this, this hospital, this medical battalion. Mm-hmm. I think before the war, because uh, our battalion had been around since 2014, uh, helping in the Donbass in the old war, mm-hmm. helping army medical units, volunteer ambulance crews. Uh, they had less than 100 members. Um, prior to the full-scale invasion. Mm-hmm. And and now, just in our base alone, there had to be over 200 people, mm-hmm. you know, 300. And, and we had people every, elsewhere in the country. Um, so as quick as I could get a vehicle in, I, I'm just watching this over days. Uh, we, we had a little cafeteria in the basement, and they would get like a, a yellow van, a white van, and and then it would go off a couple hours later, and it would come back green, mm-hmm. you know? It was, it was all very fast. Um, I would spend a lot of time in my room, but I, I would just try to help with boxes, move boxes. It, it wasn't like a, the British Army, the American Army, like, right, you're doing this, you're doing Nobody would talk to you. So mm. I, I just tried to get to know some of the Ukrainians that could speak English. Um, what they started doing, they, they had a room in the basement where they were teaching in Ukrainian, they were teaching medical skills, um, teaching things that I, I only know about now. Uh, tactical medicine with the tourniquets, mm-hmm. um, how to stop bleeding, how to control airways issues, like, like basic paramedic skills. Right. Um, but there was no training for, for foreigners. You know, so I, I, w- I would sit in these Ukrainian classes. Uh, eventually, more people started coming. We, we probably had about 40 foreigners at the mm-hmm. time from, from all over the world. But this, uh, this, this really good looking nurse shows up um, from an American nurse, you know, just and, um, and, and, and right away, all the guys start looking at her and everything, and uh, she made a few comments, said, yeah, I've just spent the last two weeks with 200 guys, 
So I've seen it all and I'm not up for it. And, and I thought, right, she's no nonsense. You know, let's not give her a hard time. She was a trauma nurse from Colorado. Mm -hmm. um, and over the next few days, she started forming a training program, the same as the Ukrainians were being trained, um, but for, for an English language syllabus. Right. Yeah, so I said, right, right, I, I, need, to, I need to get involved with this because I'm, I'm going to be in the medical battalion and, and nobody's asking me to do anything, so I, I should learn to do things. Mm -hmm. And um, she's like, right, we're going to do this for training, we're going to learn this, we're going to learn that. And um, the next day, uh, someone says, oh, we're going to learn uh, IVs. Mm -hmm. You know, like sticking a needle in your arms. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I was like, ooh, ooh, ooh. Um, and there was this old man, you know, 55 years old, I guess. Um, and I was, he spoke English, so I, I talked to him and I said, yeah, we're going to learn this tomorrow. Now, I've never done that before. And um, he's sitting by this table here and he, he just happens to sort of grab a catheter. He's like, would you like to try? He just hands me his arm. I was like, I don't know how to do that. I don't know. He's like, you will learn. And, and I was like, oh my God. Um, so I, I basically, with this man, he had a few catheters there and he, he showed me the basics. He said, mm -hmm. right, you need to tie a little tourniquet around the arm. Yep. Um, you need to search for the vein to heal it. You gotta take an alcohol swab, yep. wipe it down. He's like, all right, now try. And I was like, but how? He's like, oh, just like this. I think with about five catheters over the next 20 minutes, I, I massacred the, the man's arm. <laughs> um, but I, I was scared to do it, you know, like, oh, I, I, I don't want to hurt you. He's like, no, 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 you have to push. Right. And, and Take a run up. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's like, and when you're in, you're not fighting, so you need to push more. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I, I I felt like I was a bit of an asshole, a bit of, you know, making this man's arm bleed everywhere. The training continued. Uh, with, with different groups of, of foreigners, either native English speakers, non-English speakers, mm -hmm. for about 10 days. Um, Rebecca, uh, the, the trainer, this hot American nurse, right. um, she said when we did a more formal class with the IV, she said, now you're going to take my arm and do it. Um, well, I think I did okay, but I didn't I didn't occlude what we call put the proper pressure down when I inserted it. Mm -hmm. I had blood went flying everywhere because they're quite big gauge needles. Um, I just, I just, um, I just massacred this woman's arm, but, but something about her being a woman, I, I got sick in my stomach. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what I'd like to say with all this training is going on, um, they didn't know what to do with all the foreigners, the influx of foreigners. Mm -hmm. As the vehicles were coming, they would obviously have to find at least one Ukrainian that spoke English, you know, to make the teams. So it became real apparent to us that, that not all of us were ever going to get on a, on a team, mm -hmm. right? And um, a couple of days later, an American boy showed up, uh, tall, good looking, you know, big arms. Um, and he shows up to sleep in my bedroom, like at night, they have a bunk in there. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm just lying there on my bed and he, and he comes up, he's like, uh, how are you doing? I'm Trent, I'm from Utah. He's like this, and he, I look at his arms like this. Yeah, I'm here to serve in the war. Hey, do you know where a fella could get a reach around here in Kiev? And I was like, that's his opening question. That's his opening question. Do you know what I mean? And I was like, he's a little bit bizarre. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah oh, I've done this, I've been there, I'm, you know, I'm pretty high speed, low drag. And right. I was like... Is, is this the, the, the recognized sign language for a, a bullshitting soldier? Yeah, pretty much. It, 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 they're usually Americans, but I just always like this. I've, I've noticed you've adopted that a number of times. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, so he's quite a character, you know. Mm -hmm. um, what happens over the next few days, um, he's always, uh, we call him Captain America. Mm -hmm. ah. And uh, Ukrainians would be asking him, who speaks some English, mm -hmm. uh, what, did, what did you do? And he's like, oh, I was a, I was a 3B or whatever, like, like some American call sign designation. Right. I didn't know what they were talking about. They didn't know what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. um, we, I sort of think maybe he's a bit full of shit. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to vet the foreigners one day with the trainees going on. And uh, I'll never forget this to the day I die. Um, I went before him. We had to go through an interview. Mm -hmm. And what there was, there was a Ukrainian girl at a desk mm -hmm. uh, with a laptop, yeah. and they're doing her spreadsheets, whatever. But then there was this American guy who maybe was actual special forces one day maybe. Mm -hmm. And then there was a British guy, normal lad from, from Yorkshire, actually, Paul Riddle, nice man. 
he, he was in the dry rooms back mm-hmm. in the day or something, you know. So um, I had to go for an interview. And uh, the, I, my biggest thing was I, I never wanted to lie. So I said, uh, I said to them, I'm, I'm going to tell the truth. I'm going to tell the truth. Um, the first question uh, from the American Special Forces guy was, um, what did you do before the war? Mm-hmm. And I was like, um, I built kitchens for IKEA. And they all looked at each other like, yeah. I was like, um, any 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 uh, military experience? I said, yeah, I uh, was in the army quite some years ago in the Black Watch, uh, but no combat experience. I'm like, oh, and the British guy said, the Black Watch is a good regiment. Mm-hmm. And then I started getting a bit of confidence. I was like, the Black Watch is a good regiment. <laughs> and uh, any combat? I said, uh, no, I did a brief stint in Northern Ireland, very brief. And the Americans like, Northern Ireland, what's that? I was like, oh, it's like Bosnia 2000 uh, when I was there. Not a shot fired. Mm-hmm. And he said, okay. Um, so what do you want to do here? I said, well, I just want to help any way I can. Um, any role. I was, I was thinking as the driver, but they don't want me as a driver. Um, okay. Uh, do, you want to, um, do you want to go to the front? I said, well, I'll go wherever you need me. Mm-hmm. Um, my biggest thing is I don't want to let anybody down. I just want to do the best I can. And they're like, okay, so you have no problem going to the front if that's where you need me. And they're like, okay, welcome on board. Uh, we'll get you a team in the next couple of days. I was like, well, this, is, this is good, you know? This is good. I, I, was, I was actually quite, I, I, I've always had self-esteem problems my whole life, but I was like, I told the truth. I told my intentions, and they're like, we'd love to have you. Mm. Um, but I wanted to be a fly on the wall because Captain America was uh, right behind me. Right. Yeah, yeah, to inside all your dreams, to get through the door. Uh, kind of, you know what I mean, like the coat yeah. hanger sort of thing, you know. But he mm. did have, he did have quite a nice uh, physique, you know. Mm. I, I won't take that away from him. Um, so I went and sat right back down again, and there was him. And uh, then the next question: What did you do before the war? I was like, I was in Fifth Group Special Forces, trained the Tank Mountain Division, been to Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan. And I was with the GR three four five six seven eight, and I also did with the four three two one. Mm-hmm. And they're like, right. And this is even the American. And then, um, well, we don't have a position for you now, but if you help them uh, load the boxes, we'll let you know. And I was like, see how the world works. Mm. You know, I really took something away from that. Um, within the next few days, I got my team. Yeah, mm-hmm. and. Um, what happened, I'm trying to do as much training, I'm trying to do as best I can, mm-hmm. but I'm getting a little bit bored of the camp, right? Um, and apparently, I don't drink, mm-hmm. but there's a bar that's open, you know, from the church, St. Michael's Church, it's no secret where we were based, okay? If you walk down the road, there's the Intercontinental Hotel, and that is a very big, prominent hotel mm-hmm. where your NBC, your CBC, your BBC, your... Everyone's staying, the Red Cross is staying, all these, mm-hmm. these big wigs. And just down the road from there, there's a place called Buena Vista. It's a cafe on the top, mm-hmm. but down the basement, it's a pub. And it's kind of got like that speakeasy feel, because you, you go down to the basement. Okay. Uh, there's a prohibition in Ukraine, okay, and there's a curfew. You know, they do not violate curfew, but uh, prohibition, who's that hurting? And um, I would go at the end of the day's training, uh, two, three days, I think, with my friends after the training and I, and I would be quiet you know just keep to myself with my friends and just enjoy an atmosphere that's not work yeah but it's all full of foreigners and and uh, and all these journalists and it, I don't know like maybe it's like an expat hub of some sort but it kind of had like a Saigon feel in my imagination oh, all right yeah. I don't know why um, but that you'd hear people in the background and uh, they'd be like yeah, when I was in Luchin or Keen, we seen this, and I did this, but don't quote me on that. And and it, it seemed like it was utter bullshit, you know, mm-hmm. like coming out of these people, like two, three beer. Um, one of our trainers, who uh, he was talking to every journalist. He was an American man from, uh, from California, I believe, a paramedic. Mm-hmm. Very good trainer, but he went on one rotation to Air Keen and decided that shelling wasn't for him, mm-hmm. so he, he was going to be a trainer. But every journalist, oh, come meet this person, that person. Uh, he knew that pub quite well. But uh, the last time I ever went to the pub, uh, there was me 
Uh, there was an American boy who he always walked around with a knife and a grenade in his pocket. Uh, he had like cargo trousers, you mm -hmm. know, like the, the hiking ones, like the North Face. And he just said, yeah, well, this is this is it. You know, we're not allowed to bring guns out into the city, but uh, if the Russians come, they're never taking me. But other than that, he was quite sensible, surprisingly. Mm. Uh, other than just a grenade and a Rambo knife, he was actually one of the most sensible people I ever met. Um, there was me, there was him, and there was three of the Swedes, but not the fourth Swede we came with. Um, he was back at the base. Everyone's having a pint, and I'm, I'm drinking with the Coke. One of the Swedish boys gets a phone call, and it's like, yes, yes, what? And I'm like, you know, because we're in war, so when I think of a what, you know, it's not like a drama with your girlfriend. Mm -hmm. And he's like, he did what? Anyway, uh, he hangs up the phone. He's like, Stan shot someone. And I'm like, what? One of the other Swedes. And it's like, what? He sh it's like, everyone has to go back to base now. So naturally, the Swedes are just like good British boys. Go, 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 go. Finish that pint. And the next one that was the order, they were all double parking at the time, you know, right, at the okay. uh, Everybody slammed their pint. Well, waste is a terrible thing. Yeah, 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 this is the thing. And we're only talking like an extra minute, you know. Okay. Um, we all ran back to the base. And uh, see, our battalion's policy is not to issue people with weapons. Right. But in Ukraine, Ukrainians can buy weapons, they can, they can do with it. And what you do with a weapon, because uh, we're a medical battalion, mm -hmm. some medics have, some medics don't have weapons. Mm -hmm. um, but what had happened over the previous week, two weeks, I'm told there'd been eight in our building NDs, negligent discharges. Okay? Right, yes. So these are Ukrainians who had, they own a gun, they might know how to use a gun, or their uncle had given them a gun, from AKs to Makarov pistols to the there and the barracks. Like, boom! You know, uh, I heard one of them before. Mm -hmm. But apparently now, this uh, this Swedish Marine uh, medic who had 12 years in the army, out of all people, um, we were all lined up on a line, but where is he? Mm -hmm. um, well, he shot someone, that's what we're told. And um, first thing, Nemo, he's like our second in command, Sergeant Major. Um, he, he's quite a big man, mm -hmm. you know, speaks very good English, thank you. With the mobile beach. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> I can zoom in, jump on him. And uh, in Ukrainian, he's yelling to everyone on base that's all on the line. Uh, and then in English, everybody will hand their weapons in. And then he comes by to the American guy who always wants to remain anonymous. Mm -hmm. And he looks in, and grenades. And he's like, oh. Um, what happened? Um, the Swede mm -hmm. had a sushka. That's like the mini AK, you know, the little short AK. Right, yes. And somebody, it wasn't his, but somebody gave it to him. And he's clearing the weapon, you know, uh, take the magazine off, pull the bolt back, clear the round out. Um, the round did not clear properly. Mm -hmm. And uh, when it went forward and he pulled the trigger to clear it, the round came out, but he didn't have the weapon pointed towards the sandbag. So it hit the concrete, the round ricocheted and hit another person. Mm. But it wasn't just anybody. It was our commanding officer's father. Yeah, yeah, but not fatally. Um, mm -hmm. it, it entered about here below the elbow and it came out his shoulder. Uh, yeah. and later on, he does have diminished diminished capacity of, of, of the use of his arm. Mm -hmm. Um, but this isn't this isn't shooting another soldier. You know, you've heard about a blue on blue. Mm -hmm. This is a serious bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is not really a good strike for the foreigners or yeah. uh, nominally part of the Swedes. Mm -hmm. Um. But anyway, nothing was really said about that. Um, apparently, apparently uh, accidents do happen in Ukraine. So he's, he's gone on to do weird and wonderful things. Um, but he's shot the commanding officer's dad in his, in his mm. second week in Ukraine. There was... Yeah, yeah, not great, yeah. No. Uh, so we have to get you from where you are now in the story. 
uh, to eventually they send you somewhere to do a thing. Yeah, well, that, that was the thing. It was always a big fear. Am I going to get made onto a team? Am yeah. I not going to get made onto a team? And uh, right around the time, pretty much about a day after, mm -hmm. um, the, um, the CEO dad got shot, I got made onto a team. Uh, there was, our commander was a, a Ukrainian girl, a paramedic, mm -hmm. she was about 28. She'd apparently been wounded in the old war in Donbass, right. and she'd come back for a full-scale invasion. Mm -hmm. uh, there was her boyfriend, who was a driver, and he, he was kind of a big heavyset boy with a beetle's head at that. Um, yeah, like a George Harrison. Mm -hmm. um, he used to be the driver. There was Dima, who was an anesthesiologist uh, student from mm -hmm. Kharkiv, mm -hmm. uh, who had to leave, because Kharkiv was Kharkiv, and a French doctor named Edouard. So, and him and Rebecca had taught the whole program to us. Um, that, that was it. That was my, uh, that was our teammate ready to go. We got mm -hmm. an ambulance. We, we cleaned the ambulance. We, we seen, you know, this is how the gurney goes in and out. This is how we get our supplies. Mm -hmm. um, the Battle of Kiev was essentially pretty much over right at that point. So now all the teams going from Bucha to Irpin to everywhere. Now you're going to go to Donbass. Now you're going to go to Zaporizhia. Now you're going to go to Nikolaya. Mm -hmm. we, we didn't know where we were going to go. Um, and we got a notice that uh, you're going to the Zaporizhia front. I was like, okay, well, that's, that's that. And you're going to leave more. But uh, <coughs> this is something I'll never forget with my commanding officer. Um, she delayed it for two days because of Dima. Dima's from Kharkiv. Mm -hmm. And he went to our commander and said, can I have a delayed rotation? Why? Well, my grandmother's house has been blown up, um, and she's gone to live in a shelter in Kharkiv, and that shelter's been blown up, so now she's somewhere else. I'm really concerned about my grandmother. Um, Yana, Yana Zenkovic, she, she's a woman, she's our commander. Uh, she's in a wheelchair, by the way. Um, she's a very strong woman. She delayed our rotation. She said, well, you, you're an anesthesiologist. Uh, it's very important, doctor, because I need you to be focused. Um, you, you, and you can take one other person, mm -hmm. and she gave money and funds, go get your grandmother, get, get, to, get to Kharkiv as quick as you can, mm -hmm. get your grandmother, bring her back here, and we'll arrange accommodation for her, and then you can go to work. I don't know any army in the world that would do that. Mm -hmm. um, Dima went, and then, uh, of course, we were delayed a couple of days, and now you know. Um, I went on my first rotation to the war, to actual war, war. Right. Well, we'll find out about that in the next video. Thank you so much for coming on. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. <laughs>
three years ago, energy independent, powerful military that was totally rebuilt. The president announced three days ago, which he should never have said, publicly classified information, that we have no ammunition. Now, what do you think China says when they hear we have no ammunition? Uh, no, it's a very, very sad thing. If you look at the worst border in history, we had the best border in history. We had, three years ago, the best border we've ever had. We built hundreds of miles of wall. We got Mexico free of charge. You know, they say about Mexico. Mexico gave us billions of dollars worth of soldiers for years, 28,000 soldiers guarding our border. We had the best numbers we've ever had. Today we have, I think, the worst numbers in the world, because I don't think there's any country in the world that would stand for what's happening to us with millions of people flowing in from, by the way, mental institutions, insane asylums. They don't like me using those names, insane asylums. But we have very bad, very sick people, very ill people coming into our country, prisons and jails all over the world. And it's not the four countries that we sort of consider neighbors. It's all over. Last week, we had 129 countries represented as our people that came into our country illegally. And we're losing our country, and we're losing the spirit of our country. But I will tell you, make America great again, and MAGA, and America first, and all of these things that we talk about. There's never been more spirit. Look at this crap. There's never been more spirit than we have right now. 2024. <laughs> 2024 is the most important election that we've ever had. Right. And I used to say it with 2016, and I meant it 100%. But we're now, we're going into an, almost a communistic state, and I think maybe we're even there. When you look at what they're doing with, you could call it fascist, you could call it Marxist, you could call it communist, what they're doing, like with the Department of Justice, they've totally weaponized it. It's weaponized like we've never had this before. It's not only me. Catholics, you see what's happening? Uh, parents and school boards, they're being harassed by the Justice Department, by the FBI. Nobody's ever seen what's happening right now. And we have a guy, the head of this country, it's, it's probably not him, it's people around him. They have people that are vicious and smart and have horrible ideas for our country. So it's really the people, in my opinion, because I don't think this guy can put together two sentences. I watched him last night. He's almost... <laughs> He's almost incapable of talking, and you know we have. I'm not. I'm not sure he knows today's Tuesday, sir. Uh, we have a. We have a problem. We have the potential of a war beyond the war with Russia and Ukraine, and that would have never happened before. By the way, if I were president, that would have never happened. If I were president, Ukraine and Russia. I want to get to that. You know, I came here today, and I I watched. All of, I watch the two hours with Mark Levin, I watch your hour with Tucker, I watch your hour um, uh, who, who, for Brett Baer, you did two hours with me, I watch you on Maria, I, sit, I watch your interviews, and I on fake news, CNN. Um, I watch that too. Well, that was a good one. That was a good one. They had a town hall. That was a Trump They fashion. ended up firing the head of CNN, because, and they got the highest ratings in 11 years, and they fired. It's supposed to be the app, by the way. You might want to start a show, and at the end of every show, say to somebody, you're fired. That would work, right? You're fired. Uh, all right. Look, but I wanted to talk about the problems and the solutions. In other words, what are the, identify the problems and the solutions. Yeah. We cannot ignore today's events, today when you put out your, your truth social post. And by that, I want to talk about what is clearly now what the Judiciary Committee under Jim Jordan is looking into, whether or not our FBI and our Department of Justice have been weaponized and politicized. And I have two headlines here. You know, FBI tipped off Biden team, Secret Service, about plan to interview Hunter, according to a supervisory agent who retired. Tomorrow, there will be another IRS whistleblower, just like this man, Mr. Chapley, who came out and said, no, he should have been indicted on felony charges, and I've been doing this, meeting Hunter Biden. Then I can take you back, and you know that I covered this every single night, and my show was vindicated on the issue right. of Trump-Russia collusion that never occurred. The Durham report corroborated. It's a Horowitz report. It's a long way of me asking this very simple, basic question, and that is, if you look at Hillary Clinton and the way she was treated, no prosecutor would prosecute, 
33,000 subpoenaed emails deleted, devices destroyed. Then her dirty dossier. And that dossier was used to get four FISA warrants. And then you look at the FBI in 2019. They had Hunter Biden's laptop in December of 2019. They verified it in March of 2020. And yet FBI agents in the months leading up to that election were meeting with big tech companies, telling them, according to Yoel Roth, the former Twitter integrity site head, telling them that it might be about Joe or Hunter. That laptop story got censored. The American people were denied the truth about what would be a bombshell story. And by the way, it still is censored because they haven't really gotten into the meat with all of the great reporting done, and this has been some great reporting done. Generally speaking, the press is fake. It's fake, and it's just uh, horrible, actually. But there's still been some great reporters and great reporting done, and you are at the lead. You've been incredible. But I when you look, you. but Sean, when you look at that, they haven't even gotten to the bottom of the laptop. They don't want to put the pictures in. They don't want to. They have pictures in there that anybody else can go away for 10 years. What happened to Hunter is he got a traffic ticket. Other people are being sentenced to many years in jail for doing much less. He got a traffic ticket. The only good thing is the people know it's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. Now, uh, Jim Jordan and Jamie Comer, these guys are doing a great job. But the problem is you find out the crime, but nothing happens with it. Instead, they go after you. Like, for example, Hillary Clinton's home wasn't raided. Joe Biden's garage wasn't raided. The UPenn Center wasn't raided. The University of Delaware wasn't raided. His home, beach home, I don't know how he affords a beach home on a senator's salary, that wasn't raided. Hunter Biden is being protected, obviously. Um, cocaine in the White House, 10-day investigation, they, they, they literally interviewed nobody Okay, investigation's over. Would that have happened in your White House? Well, well, listen to this. Even you mentioned the beach home. Well, the beach home had all these documents in it, right? It was by the Corvette. They're on the floor. Classified documents. Oh, no, that's not the place. beach home. That's the beach home was another place. No, no, found. This is also the beach home. And they had the Corvette. Where they had the Corvette. Yeah. And a tremendous amount of payment was made for that home by somebody to Joe Biden. And it was a big story for about one day. And then you don't hear about it anymore. It's incredible. But when you look at the documents all over the place, whatever happened to that one? They go after me on documents, and I have the Presidential Records Act, which is a big deal. And the Presidential Records Act is a is is an act. <laughs> Thank you. Why, Why weren't, weren't their they homes know better than anybody else? Why weren't their homes raided? Well, let me just tell you, I'm protected by Presidential Records Act, and they come up with this obscure, crazy theory, a madman theory. This guy is a deranged prosecutor. He's had tremendous failures all over the place. He's a nasty, horrible human being. They come after me. Now, they have, Biden has many, many thousands. I mean, he's got 2,000, almost 2,000 boxes of documents. They can't get to him because the college or whatever that has him doesn't want to give him. But, and he probably told the college. But more importantly, China gives millions of dollars to UPenn. That's where he has some. He's got them all over the place. And maybe worst of all, he's got documents in Chinatown. In Chinatown, many, many documents, boxes of documents. You don't ever hear about this. All you hear about is Trump. And I'm totally covered by the Presidential Records Act and also by the Clinton Sachs case. You know what that is? That's where Clinton took out tapes in Sachs and he put them in his drawer. And they sued him just on a very civil basis. And he ended up winning the lawsuit. And the judge said he can have whatever he wants. And that's called the presidential record. What about Sandy Berger shoving documents down his pants? Oh, there are many instances of it. But especially when you're president, and Joe Biden wasn't president. You're only covered by the Presidential Records Act if you're president. Joe Biden wasn't president. In fact, Joe Biden was senator for many years. And they've got a lot of classified documents when he was senator. And other Democrat senators can't even believe the fact that he has these documents. Can't even. They said, I watched Dick Durbin. There's another beauty. I watched Dick Durbin saying, I can't believe that he took them. I couldn't, he couldn't even believe it. So it's a very, it's a two-tier system, but it's worse than that. It's a very corrupt system. Okay, so my, my question to you is, when you see that Hillary had top secret classified information, and the conclusion of Jim Comey, no prosecutor would ever prosecute, 33,000 subpoenaed emails deleted, devices destroyed. Okay, then we have the FBI in early October, 
of 2016 sent agents over the pond to meet with Christopher Steele. They offered him a million dollars to, to verify any part of that to get dossier. Trump. To get Trump. Okay? They couldn't verify it. Then, in late October, even though it wasn't verified, they used that, according to Andrew McCabe, Deputy FBI Director, without that dirty dossier, they would never have gotten those FISA warrants approved. Now, they knew that they couldn't verify it. The Durham report confirmed none of it was true. And yet, they used that as a backdoor to spy on your campaign and your presidency. Yep. Is that a dual system of justice? That's right, and the whole thing with FISA was horrible. But you know, one thing we did that was so great, I fired Comey very early. And a lot of people said, oh, you should have done it. Well, you know, they're given a term. They're given a term very early. Not immediately early, but very early, early in a few months. And I got rid of this guy. And by doing that, it was like you threw a rock at a hornet's nest. The whole thing collapsed. You saw the love letters back and forth with the different people talking about the insurance policy. No, the insurance policy, that was against me. That was how it If she, for some reason, loses, darling, we have an insurance policy. The insurance policy is they'll get me out. One way or the other, they'll get me out. Because you know what, this is 30, 35 years of being put into government, and you get there, and initially, I didn't know people in Washington. I was there 17 times in my entire life. I never stayed over, never stayed over before this. All of a sudden, I'm president of the United States. I relate, and we had tremendous people also. Don't forget, biggest tax cuts in history, biggest regulation cuts in history, rebuilt our military, took out ISIS. Took out Soleimani, took out al-Baghdadi, the two biggest terrorists in the world. I mean, what we did was incredible. Strongest border we've ever had. Everything was good. No inflation. Best economy in history. We did all of this stuff. We had tremendous, we had tremendous people. Look, they made a lot of money. Yeah. No, no, so we had tremendous people. But we also had some, you rely on others. You rely on people that you knew. You rely on other politicians to give you answers. And you find out that they are uh, rhinos or they gave you bad advice. So we had some that weren't good. But when you think, uh, Comey had a term. He had many years left in that term. I said, this guy's bad news. I realized it very early, very early in the administration. I fired him. And it was wild. That's when we found out all of the corruption. Had I not fired told me, you wouldn't know any of the things that you were talking you about. You think they would have destroyed you? Well, they were trying to take me out. Yeah, they were trying to take me out. I mean, it was like a coup. It was like a coup. Had I not, you know, it's very interesting. Some yeah. people that are very smart, that you know very well, said when I did it, oh, that was a mistake, that was a mistake, you're going to cook. Now they say it was the greatest instinctual move they've ever seen because Comey was a very bad guy. And Comey led that group of uh, thugs in there. And they were doing a number. They were it's very dishonest. It's years and years of putting in people, Democrats and rhinos and other people, but putting them into office. And we got rid of a lot of them. But we're going to get rid of a lot more, a lot more. Because you have some bad people. One more question here. In the past, I think it's been a mistake. I, I'm like you. I, I think we should have paper ballots, same day voting, make election day a national holiday have partisan observers in every precinct watching the voting and, right and then watching the vote counting and when the polls close, declare a winner, game over. Right. But that's not the system we have. Republicans have been reluctant and resistant towards early voting, mail-in voting, and, and they've also been resistant towards legal ballot harvesting, which Democrats have mastered, which is why they can hide in their basement run hundreds of millions of dollars in ads and and never answer a press question or shake a hand or kiss a baby or do a town hall. My question is, do you now encourage and embrace early and voting, voting by mail, and legal ballot harvesting? I do, but I also have to say something else, because the one thing a lot of people, but this is important, including you, do. don't talk about, they also create phony ballots. And that's a real problem. That's my opinion. But they, they create, create a lot of phony ballots. ballots. Has your mind shifted? In other words, I think if Republicans start out election day down 200, 300, 500,000 votes, that's, that becomes nearly impossible to catch up with. For some reason, Republicans always wanted to go out on Tuesday and they wanted to vote. I respect that. I think it's great. 
and it would be great if we could get back to one day and we all the things that you said with one I agree with you with voter ID with voter ID because the Democrats don't want the voter verification how about this they don't want voter ID because they want to cheat you know they want to cheat they don't want voter ID even the Democrats regular Democrat people want voter ID but the leaders don't because they can't cheat the one thing we have to be very careful of is phony ballots everything you say is true but they create ballots that's my opinion and that's the opinion of a lot of people. Will you yeah. encourage your voters, based on the system we have, to ha go along with the system of early voting and voting by mail? I, I will. I think if you don't, then it's a big mistake. No, no, no. I will, but those ballots get lost also, Sean. You know, they send them in, and all of a sudden they're gone. Those ballots get lost also. The answer is I will because you would like it. But you okay. know what? Can I be honest? For me. Okay. But a lot. I got to take a break. But Sean. A lot of bad things happen to those ballots also. They're sent in early, and all of a sudden, where are they? Bad, look, we have very corrupt elections. We have no borders. If you don't have borders, and if you don't have good elections, you don't have a country, and that's where we are. But I'm okay. By the end of, by the end of this year, we'll probably have, under Joe Biden, nearly 8 million illegal immigrants since he's been president. Quick, quick break. Hey, Sean Hannity here. Hey, click here to subscribe to Fox News' YouTube page and catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis. Whoa. No way. To your right, sir. Our next question to your right. No way. Wait, did you say this is the last question? No, I said our, my, our next question to oh, your right. okay. Tucker, thank you for bringing common sense to a world of nonsense. Every day, we appreciate Thank that. Thank you. My, my name's Terrence Bates, and here's my question. I'm 49 years old as well, and I have never seen our country in such chaos. My question is this. Do you think the left is so unhinged and so chaotic because they are desperate for attention, because all the attention right now is on President Trump and how well he's doing? You know, I think that's part of it. Um, I think that's part of it. I also think, and I've thought a lot about this just because my show, you know, whatever you like it or not, it's like the only show where there is a debate every night, and I try to make it a more symmetrical debate. It's very hard to get, to be a, you know, I, I don't want to beat up on like some college kid every night. It's like, you know what I mean? I don't mean to do that. I don't, I don't enjoy doing that. So I really try to get the other side to the extent as possible. So I see a lot of what people I disagree with say. And I've really concluded that the differences are far deeper than I thought they were. And Trump has brought this into stark relief because we're not having, so for my whole, I've been on TV 22 years and mostly on debate shows. And for most of that time, we were having policy debates. What, what I thought were, you know, I'm pretty liberal, as you, you know, I may have revealed. And so I assumed they were policy debates. Like there's this thing, you know, we're debating, you know, name something, I don't know. This policy, it's gun control. I would have these gun control debates, and that, I mean, I'll admit I'm a lifelong hunter, and I, you know, own a lot of guns, so I, maybe I'm emotional, too emotional about everything, but I don't think I'm that emotional, and I would have these debates, and I'm like, okay, here's the data, you know, here's the social science, I'm showing you mine, you show me yours, and we'll decide who's got a better case. And for like 20 years, they'd be like, no, I don't care what you say. Like, they were never convinced at all, like at all, by anything I ever said. And not just the polemical stuff, but like the facts. And I began to think maybe we're having two separate conversations. Maybe I'm trying to win this person over with reason, but this person is doing something very different. Maybe this person is just trying to exert control over me. And I thought that can't be right because who'd want to control another person? That's like literally the last thing I would want to do. And I have zero interest. Because I don't need to, because I have like a happy wife and happy marriage and happy kids, and I don't, I don't, I don't want to control other people. Why would you want that? I just think it's bizarre. It's so far from the way I see the world that I just couldn't imagine that anybody else felt that way, which is a huge mistake, by the way. You know, just because you don't like the statue doesn't mean someone else doesn't. You know, people have different motives up there. And what I've concluded is that. This is not at all a policy debate, and I'm an idiot for pretending it was for all these decades. What it's really about is power. So conservatives, or I don't even know conservative, what is the word anymore? I don't even know. People who aren't like on that side. Who aren't screaming at people they disagree with and rest them. 
If you can't imagine a scenario where you would scream at a politician you didn't vote for in a public place, then we're on the same side. Okay, that's all I'm saying. So, for for people like us, the point of politics is utilitarian. Like you vote for someone in order that like whoever's in power back off enough that you can have a happy family or a successful business or go to church, whatever the church you want, you know, just like to make room for the things that actually matter, which are not politics. Okay, that's the whole point from our perspective of the system is to give us enough freedom to do our thing. That's not how they see it at all. So it really does break down according to temperament. It's not like people are convinced most of the time to join a side. It's like they feel it. I see it in my own children. I really do. I had this one child I thought was liberal. I'm serious. Because we'd walk through Georgetown and there were these homeless people and most of my kids were like, hey, back off, homeless guy. And then there we had, I had this one daughter who was like, can we take him home? I'm like, oh, liberal. <laughs> and, and I always used to say to my wife, you know, she's going to grow up, she's going to be chaining herself to White House gates for animal rights or something. You know what I mean? I really like this child so much, though. So it was like, okay, you got one liberal out of four, it's fine. That child has not turned out to be liberal at all, like at all, because she went to all these liberal schools and she looks around and she goes, I'm not quite sure what you're into, but I'm definitely not into that at all. Like, I don't want any part of that. Why do you want any part of that? It's not about the policies. It's like, because she's kind of a happy person and she doesn't need to join a group of unhappy people in order to feel powerful. So what it really comes down to is if the left is a party-based movement. I didn't get this for years, even though it's my job to understand it. I never understood it. It's a party-based movement. The average Republican is a Republican because it's the party that's closest to his views, right? But like if the Republican Party supported something that you, you really hated, you'd be like, yeah, no, I'm not voting for you anymore. W right? Of course. If your loyalty is into the Republican Party, then maybe the party that represents you. She wants to, to see them win. So you'll be left alone. The Democratic Party, doesn't matter what they do. They invaded Canada tomorrow. You'd watch every MSNBC agent be like, you know, Canada's been a threat for a long time. We haven't, you know, we haven't really talked about it. You know, there are Canadians living in our midst. Let's intern them. I'm not kidding. They obey. They obey. They're obedient little people. And they're obedient. They're obedient because... The group is where their power comes from. This explains a lot, actually. It explains their hysteria at Trump and Brett Kavanaugh and the Congress. So I, I spent eight years living in the District of Columbia with Barack Obama as president, who I thought was actually kind of wrecking the country. I'd see Valerie Jarrett at Safeway. I never said word one to her. I shared a backyard with Susan Rice for six years. Yeah, I did it. I mean, we didn't share a backyard. Our backyard, we had a fence between our backyards. There's our house right there. Shave and Ruth, Susan Rice. Yeah, yeah, okay. I'd see her every Halloween. No, I no, we had a Halloween parade in our street, and I would always have a beer with Susan Rice. I'm serious. Actually, I always got along with Susan Rice. I don't know. I don't. I don't want to be mad at people. I don't. I didn't see it that way. By the way, one of her kids became a like right winger at Stanford. Good for him. Anyway, the point is. The point is, it never occurred to me, as much as I profoundly disapprove of what she was doing, to be mean to her, because why would you ever do something like that? It's just like not even, it never even occurred to me. Our kids played the same soccer team, actually. But anyway, whatever. The point is, because it's D.C. Now, the other side feels like you literally are not allowed to go to Starbucks. Like, you're just not allowed. Why? Because... They are so threatened by the loss of political power that they can't think straight. What you're seeing is people who are threatened. Like, I feel like I'm pretty reasonable when someone feels threatened. You know, I'm serious. Like, if I felt like you were threatening me, threatening my family, my job, something I really cared about, I'd be very unreasonable with you. And I think you would be with me if you felt I was threatening you. Like, really, as a person, threatened. An election does not threaten me. It threatens them. Because a lack of political power means to them a lack of personal power. They are personally invested. Politics is how they feel powerful. 
They are terrified people. And politics makes them feel calm. I know I'm getting kind of shrinky on you here. But it's true. It's totally true. This has just come to me in like the past month after all these years of having arguments over policy. And I'm like, well, but maybe we could find the best way. Like, no, I don't care what the best way is. I want to make sure you obey me. And you really think about this. This is the last thing I said. Think of it this way. So this is a group full of, I mean, I don't know what your politics are, but it's probably not that many. Yeah, I know what your politics are. Okay, just, just kidding. <laughs> but when you go back tonight to wherever you live, I bet you it's 20 bucks a person that you're not going to lie awake thinking, you know, somewhere in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, 3,000 miles from here, there is someone who doesn't agree with me. And I want to make sure that person is forced to agree with me. I'm not going to sleep well, I'll be honest with you. In fact, I'll bet you another 20 bucks you won't think of Williamsburg, Brooklyn at all tonight. Sure, but that's, that's but I can story. promise you that somewhere in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, there are a whole lot of people worrying that in the Mississippi Delta somewhere, in a town you've never heard of, there is one guy who's not fully with the program. And he must be brought to heel. He has real questions about this new bathroom policy. And we need, to, we need to get him in line. Because that's not politics. What you are practicing is politics. What they are practicing is theology. That's, that's an evangelical faith. A faith without a God. It's a secular religion, but it's a religion nonetheless. It's a religion that forces others to convert or suffer. That's exactly what it is. And that's why the emotional temperature is so high, unsustainably high. Anyway, that's what I think. <laughs> we Tucker, all the way in the back, center section, all the way, way back here, way back here. Oh, we, have, we have time for one last question. All right, hit me with it. This one is coming from a recent graduate of Chapman University just down the street here. All right. School of Communications, he's 24 years old, Carson Combs. Carson, what is your question? Uh, first of all, Tucker, huge fan. Thank you so much thank for you. taking my question. Uh, first of all, as a log cabin Republican, I want to thank you so much for giving us a voice on your show. Of course, the always. completely disregards us and dismisses us and likes to act like we don't exist. Um, my question to you, as a recent college graduate, I see this, these countless walkouts and aggressive, hostile riots that are massed as peaceful protests on campus um, where these essentially very whiny leftists just refuse to listen to any sort of dissenting opinion uh, to the point where there's conservative speakers who are not allowed to come on campus for safety reasons. Uh, David Rubin and Coulter Ben Shapiro, um, which is just I'm so seeing all three of those people tomorrow. How weird is that? That's awesome. Isn't that weird? I'm literally I'm all jealous. three tomorrow. <laughs> Um, but, but so my question is, what do you what do you make of the future of college campuses if this is what we're seeing so frequently on them right now? Whether it be a small school like Chapman, uh, or um, you know Berkeley, uh, or what, what do you what do you make of that? And and uh, do you see a solution to moving past these these? Well, I mean, it's, it's such a. I mean, I have you know children in college, two children in college right now, and another on the way. And so it's a question that I think about a lot. And there are a couple, it depends upon how you think of it. I mean, I, I guess the obvious point is that a lot of our humanities programs are, are not only a joke. Um, and I'm not, by the way, there's a lot about American higher education that would lead to the world still. You know, because you're taking engineering classes or the sciences or studying to be a veterinarian or a lot of really serious disciplines that are still taught and taught better than they are anywhere else. No one in my family has ever taken a class like that. I come from a long line of people with fake jobs. My father was an anchor of ABC in LA, and you know what I mean? My mother was an artist, and you know what I mean? So like in my world, it's English and history. That's what we study, and that's what my children have studied. And I have watched it really carefully and concluded that like they're not really teaching anything, so it's sort of a joke. But worse than that, there's a huge cost to this. Not just a financial problem, it's the single greatest expense for most families. The student loan debt load is 
rec literally recognizing this way that we're in the court, um, et cetera, et cetera. But there's a huge personal cost to it. I mean, there's never been a time in history where a society has taken the overwhelming majority of young people between 18 and 22 and forced them to be idle. You know, there is some percentage of college students who, who get a lot out of this and are focused and are driven. I was not like that. Um, that's which I never took it out of college, ever. And my father and his wisdom didn't want me to go. And really, it was just weak people that So you can be a journalist. Your father's idiotic. You can never leave me. I'll be like that I went. He was so unimpressed, and he was right. Um, but there's never been a society that's done that wholesale. And you know why it happened. It happened because of the GI Bill and the promise that that was the. That, that was the key to taking, you know, the step into the to the class above you, that's through the American dream. But the truth of it is, it's not actually for most people. And so what you get, especially for young men, you know, you lock up boys from, you know, during the four most vigorous years of their life in this kind of nerf padded room and feed them beer. And a lot of them go crazy, or get, I'm not joking, or get addicted a lot. I mean, what's the addiction or alcoholism rate of, you know, kids who spent four years in college? It's unbelievably high. It's like Russia high. It's bad. Russia! So there's a huge cost to this. But how to interpret, how to understand what the, the actual hysteria, I'm not using that word lightly, like the clinical hysteria, the Freudian hysteria that we're watching in college campus the total clampdown on speech and thought, where anybody who has, even the most moderate person is like, are you really sure? Shut up! You know, you're getting thrown out. What is that about? And if you think about it sort of longitudinally, you pull back a little bit, which is effective, what you're really seeing are the last moments of a dying order, actually. So people who feel secure, who feel like they have power and will have it for a long time, have a pretty light hand, actually, on others. They don't need to act like that. Because in the end, they know they're in charge. When you start to feel like you're losing control, that, and this is true across regimes, by the way, including academic regimes, you start to really clamp down in a way that beclowns you, that makes you like an idiot. And when you decide that Ben Shapiro is a right-wing extremist and must be destroyed, it's like, what? Seriously, there's an amazing videotape that says it all to me. It's from 1989, and it's of Nikolai Ceausescu, who was, of course, along with his lovely wife, Elena, uh, the dictator of Romania under when it was a Soviet satellite state. And in 1989, there was, in effect, a coup, an uprising, and he was swiftly tried uh, by a group of officers in a makeshift courtroom and led out to behind a building and executed with his wife and his son. And the whole thing is videotaped. And you can watch it, not the shooting part, but everything up to that is videotaped. And so there's Ceausescu standing there, and he's run this country for 40 years as a god, okay? Really, as like, I'm a North Korean model, and I actually worship him. And in a flash, he realizes he's about to be executed. So as he's being led out in chains by the guard who's literally about to shoot him, he turns and starts barking orders at the guard. And I'm thinking to myself, really? Lacking some perspective, I would say. You have about 45 seconds left to breathe, and you're yelling orders at the guy who's about to execute you? Why are you doing that? Because that's what they always do when they feel they're losing control. Always. So what we're really seeing is the effect of the internet. Talk to a young person, you may be one of them, probably are, who is not with the program, doesn't need to be a right winger or whatever, but not with the program, you know what the program is, what we're all required to believe, all the lies that we're required by law to tell all day long. So let's say you don't believe that and you're 22 and you're in a college. You have decided that you're thinking for yourself. That is a radical act in the current moment, okay? And you're getting all of your information from like-minded people on the internet. And it really is like a religious awakening talk to some of these people. I know you know what I'm talking about if you've just been in college, but you're reading stuff, you're like, wait, everything they're telling me is a total lie. Because it is. That is happening Google. across this country. I meet these kids. My children are some of them. And I don't mean anything creepy, hateful, anything like that. 
But once you start to realize the amount of dishonesty out there, if it's over, they can't control you again. They can't control your brain, which is exactly what they're trying to do. We can control people's behavior. Societies are allowed to do that. You can't sleep in a crosswalk. Not allowed. But we've never tried to control people's minds because that's the definition of totalitarianism. That's not what we're trying to do. Why are we trying to do that? Because the people in charge realize that the free exchange of information online makes it actually impossible for them to control what people think. So I spent my whole life complaining about the propaganda on these dumb TV networks we compete with, and Trump know it. But the truth is, it doesn't matter. None of that matters. It doesn't matter what Stephanie Rule says in the morning or whatever the Don Lamont guy or whatever on CNN. I'm pronouncing it that way. I know it's not correct, but it makes me laugh, so that's what I'm calling him, Don Lamont. <laughs> it doesn't matter because nobody younger than me well into middle age is ever going to see it because young people don't watch that stuff because it's too dumb they read the internet where you can say whatever you want so it wouldn't even occur to them to believe Don Lamont or me for that matter I'm being honest because they have another source and the people in charge of deciding what the rest of us believe know this and it scares the heck out of them and in response like Nikolai Ceausescu, they're freaking out and barking orders at the guards. It's totally fine. Their hegemony over our brains is dead. Thank God. Ha! Thank you for having me. Hey, it's Tucker Carlson. Belmont Hill is a small private school outside of Boston. It's not famous for its athletics. The school's mascot isn't even an animal. It's an 18th century navigational tool. The Belmont Hill Sextants doesn't even make sense. So when it comes to sports, Belmont Hill is not trying very hard. But the school's athletic program can claim at least one important privilege to history. In 1975, its football roster contained two names you will recognize even now, Mark Milley and Richard Levine. Milley is now the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Levine, of course, is our country's most famous admiral. Both transitioned late in life into overweight middle-aged women. Both wound up working as high-level officials in the Joe Biden administration. Their teammate at the all-boys school in Boston probably didn't have to fix his training at that time. Here's what Rick Levine looks like now. The video has been just posted on Instagram. Hello, my name is Admiral Rachel Levine, and I have the honor of being the Assistant Secretary for Health at the United States Department of Health and Human Services. Happy Pride. Happy Pride Month. And actually... Let's declare it a summer of pride. Happy summer of pride. Happy summer of pride! Rick Levine is so darn proud he'd like to tell you about it all summer, and possibly into the fall. He's got a lot to be proud of. What specifically, you ask? Well, strangely, he doesn't say. Nor does he mention his former wife or children. He doesn't tell us whether they're proud, too. Since none of them have been invited onto the Today Show to talk about their feelings, we're going to have to guess. For now, we're going to assume that his former family is proud, and why wouldn't they be? Few Americans in our history have come as far as Rick Levine. Here's a fat guy in a Halloween costume who somehow became a federal health minister. Not a small thing, you try that. Not too long ago, the same man was a married pediatrician with kids, lecturing about eating disorders at Penn State. Now he's emerged as a path-breaking lady admiral with medals on his chest. And he did all of that without winning a single naval battle, or even being female pretty inspiring. What we have here is living proof that in this country, you really can be whatever you want to be. If Rick Levine can become Admiral Rachel, why can't you be Napoleon or Lord Mountbatten, the last Viceroy of India? Ever see that guy's just Now he's emerged as a path-breaking Lady Admiral with medals on his chest. And he did all of that without winning a single naval battle or even being female. Pretty inspiring. What we have here is living proof that in this country, you really can be whatever you want to be. If Rick Levine can become Admiral Rachel, why can't you be Napoleon? Or Lord Mountbatten, the last Viceroy of India? Ever see that guy's uniform? Or why not Shaka, the legendary Zulu war chief? You could bring your assegai and leopard hide shield to work at Deloitte, and no one would be allowed to say a word about it. The HR department would have your back. Unfortunately, you can't actually do any of that. The point of Rick Levine's amazing transformation is not to free you from the inflexible husk that you were born in. 
so you can be more fully yourself, whatever you decide that is. No, that's not the point. Rick Levine's personal journey has nothing to do with you. It's about him. It's his journey. Your fantasies about becoming something totally new and different have not been approved yet. In fact, they're weird. Shaka, the Zulu war king? Come on, that's racist. Shut up and be proud of Admiral Rachel. Hi, Rachel L. Levine. She's the one who was smashed last ceiling. You just got some kind of weird fetish. So actually, now that we're saying this out loud, it's pretty clear that Rick Levine has no interest in liberating you from anything. This is not about liberation. It's the opposite. It's just another religious war, same as all the others. The people who think they're God versus everybody else. In primitive civilizations, which would include every civilization since the beginning of time and power, people assumed there were rules. Rules that no human being made, but that people could ignore only at their peril at great risk. Some called these rules nature, or natural law, or even as societies advanced, theology. But most of the time, people didn't call them anything. They didn't have to. There wasn't this debate about whether the rules were real. People assumed they were complicated because they were too young. They thought Sodom and Gomorrah were real places. They were destroyed for disobedience. They imagined the same thing could happen to them. Not anymore. Rick Levine doesn't worry about being punished by forces. He knows he's in charge. He makes the rules. He sets the rules. Reality is what he says it is. That's his view, and he shares it with virtually everybody else in a position of authority in the United States. That's a pretty bold bet, really. For seven million years, human beings have believed one thing, presumably based on some evidence. Around 2015, they began convinced of something completely different. Are they right? It's what they're going to find out soon. It wasn't like, oh, they stole the election from us. Let's loot Macy's. All right. But anyway, so I saw this and I was like, yeah, okay, was people super mad. They thought the election, I mean, this was January 6th, so like, it was, you know, it took a long time for me to figure out what happened, to be honest. I think I'm just too old, and so it's like hard to notice when things change, like certain assumptions you have, like, yeah, of course it's on the level. They wouldn't actually like, subvert an election. And then someone very smart said to me, really, people kill each other over insurance claims. Uh, this is running the world. <laughs> like, what wouldn't they do? Oh, right. Good point. Um, anyway, but I, I just kind of didn't think too much about it. Like, I'm definitely opposed to vandalism. Anyone who breaks windows is not my friend. I hate that. Have you ever glazed a window? You're put in a window? It's really hard. I mean it. If you don't think it's hard, try it. You get the size wrong, it doesn't fit, it's all pins in, it's, it's ridiculous. It's like, a, it's like an all-day affair it's to replace a divided glass. Cool. Anyway, so I don't like that at all. And I said that, I don't like it. And within like about an hour, I heard people say, well, that was a racist insurrection. And I was like, really? I didn't, I didn't know race, I didn't even do it. I didn't have one person say a word about race and an insurrection called literal is when armed people try to overthrow the government. That didn't seem to happen either. Yeah. So I just okay. pretty innocently okay. said, okay. you know, bad, probably not a racist insurrection. What? Shut up! Racist insurrectionist! <laughs> do like it. And I remember thinking, well, you know, obviously people are feeling heated. Well, like in a week or so, when, you know, the emotional devastation of this second 9-11 slash Pearl Harbor wears off, people calm down and come to their senses, and you can have a rational conversation, strip left those ears, um, sorry, I just saw a friend of mine, I think, we can have a rational conversation about what this actually was and why, and at some point, because I really believe in that aspect, someone will say, well, why were these people so mad? They, you know, none of them had criminal records, they were like, grandmoms with diabetes and like a lot of debt. They're the least powerful people in our society, like legit the least powerful. And why were they so mad? Like, why did they take the bus from Tennessee to go jump up and down in front of the Capitol? It's something taught me a better thing to do. And then maybe if they think that the election wasn't fair, we will sit them down in a very calm, rational angle. I get it. He said that Biden won by 81 votes. 15 million more than Barack Obama. It seems like a lot. Considering he didn't campaign and he can't talk. Um, but you know, there was just something about him. It was that magic, and 
You know, maybe you didn't feel it. It's like pistachio ice cream. It's not a flavor for everybody. But the people who like it really like it. 81 million. So settle down. And by the way, we have the source code in the voting machine software. And we've looked at it. And it's totally on the level. We double check. We wouldn't let like that electronic voting machine hide their software from us. We have to do that. And the drop boxes are totally monitored by law enforcement. And every person that voted had to prove he was who he said he was with the government issued ID. Like, settle down. And I would have said, fair enough, because I want to believe in our elections. Who doesn't? And in fact, the people at the Capitol on January 6th are exactly the ones who most want to believe in our elections. They're the ones who carried the pocket constitution. How many CNN anchors like deeply believe in the American political process? They put you in a camp if they could. Shut up. They have no interest in the process at all. But the people who really believed in it were naturally the most shocked and the most upset to believe it wasn't real. But anyway, I thought we would have that conversation at some point. But it never supported it. It never supported any of that. Sure. But I did think, well, maybe the upside to this actually that is still very really much against the murder. Um, you know, it'll not be something. We could have a national conversation. And I'm completely for national conversation. But every year they promise. away the things we need to have democracy, which is our core freedoms guaranteed in the Bill of Rights, just as in our war for democracy, we are supporting a government, paying for the entire government, but it's banned opposition parties, put opposition leaders in jail, shutting down free speech, now shutting down an election, and putting dissident priests in prison. It's such a democracy, they don't have elections anymore. That's how pure a democracy it is. But the second thing, and which I think more applicable to this conversation, I learned, is that their response was the test. If you want to know 
what they care about. If you want to know what's important, listen to how they respond when you say something unapproved about it. So if you were to, I don't know, write a post on Facebook tonight and say, I think Papua New Guinea is the most powerful nation in the world. You would get not a single response other than someone's been smoking weed again. No one would care. It's like demonstrably untrue. It's why the flat earth people have been able to cruise beneath the radar for so long. Because they're, and by the way, I'm not discounting that possibility for the record in case any are here. Because I am an open minded man. Present me the evidence of its flatness and I will amplify it. But the point is, when something is clearly or very likely untrue, it poses no threat to anyone. What's scary and what will elicit a response are true things. No one is punished for lying. People are only punished for telling the truth. You could literally, you could literally wake up tomorrow, move to the Bahamas, start a fake cryptocurrency, defraud a million investors around the world of billions of dollars. I'm just saying you could do it, and I'm not recommending it. Note to the FTC, not recommending it. But you could do that, and you could get caught. People might have like a balanced view of you. He's really smart, good guy. He's got a little over his skis, as we say. But like, I'm not gonna hate on him. Right? We all make mistakes. Like, who here? Raise your hand if you haven't defrauded a million investors with a fake cryptocurrency. Okay, there are some. There are some. You cast the first stone then. Um, <laughs> Chứ không phải là Speckle, speckle, 
Deixa eu ver o nosso crédito. Pode o teu dólar, Gina. Pode o teu dólar. Não ocasou isso ainda, se eu não te. Journalist Emma Jo Morris, who broke the Hunter Biden laptop story for the New York Post. I didn't know that was her. But she was immediately censored by the state on social media in an attempt to influence the 2020 election. She just delivered a mind boggling testimony on the extent of censorship in America. She is now a politics editor at Breitbart. So let's watch. This is her in front of the Congress. My name is Emma Jo Morris, a politics editor at Breitbart. Um, I'm here today because I published a series of news stories two years ago in October of 2020 about Hunter Biden's now infamous laptop, also known as the laptop from hell, uh, which has seen as some of the most scandalous reporting of the last decade. Um, what was more scandalous than the reporting itself, though, was the fact that it exposed the unholy alliance between the intelligence community, social media platforms, and legacy media outlets. At the time, I was deputy politics editor at the New York Post, and um, my reporting showed that despite then-candidates Joe Biden's repeated and furious denials, he was apparently involved in the foreign business deals of his family. Over several days, just weeks before Americans would vote for their next president, I revealed verified, authentic emails from the Biden Scion's hard drive showing Ukrainian business partners receiving leaks from the Obama White House. I documented an off-the-books meeting between then-Vice President Biden and a Ukrainian energy executive and introduced the world to the big guy um, who got action on a deal with CESC, China Energy Company. The Post published exactly how the material for the reporter was obtained, even identifying our sources, um, as well as a federal subpoena showing the FBI was in possession of the material the story was based on and had been since December of 2019. Um, but when the stories appeared on social media that morning, the venue where millions of Americans go to find their news and editors to get their angles, uh, within hours the reporting was censored on all major platforms on the basis of being called hacked or Russian disinformation. Um, Twitter refused to allow users to share the link to the story, banned the links from being shared in private messages, a policy, by the way, that's used to clamp down on child porn um, and lock the post out of its verified account. Facebook said it would curb distribution and reset the link on its platform. However, the stories were not based on hacked materials, nor were they Russian disinformation, and despite those claims appearing to come out of thin air at the time, we would eventually learn that they actually didn't come out of thin air at all. On October 19th, five days after the Post began publishing, Politico ran a story headline, Hunter Biden's story is Russian disinfo, dozens of former Intel officials say, God, I can't even say that with a straight face, you know? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Politico printed a letter complete with criticism from veteran members of the U.S. intelligence community falsely claiming that the Post expose has, quote, all the classic earmarks of a Russian information operation. Mm -hmm. Such a big movie, though. <laughs> <laughs> Most notable. 
reasonable and unmistakable belief that that letter was improper from former DNI, Michael Hayden, former CIA, John Brennan, former CIA, despite having such damaged credibility following their participation in the Russia collusion conspiracy theory. A few days later, on October 22nd, when Biden appeared in the second presidential debate and was confronted with the Fox and the Post reporting, he said to Trump, quote, 50 former national intelligence professionals said this, what he's accusing me of is a Russian plot. But it was not. And he knew that. Now, fast forward to this year, two years later. This last spring, House investigators revealed it was a call by now Secretary of State Anthony Blinken to former acting CIA Director Michael Morell that prompted the spy letter published by Politico, which bypassed agency approval processes that would have been normally applied. It is also now known that ahead of my reporting, federal agencies were planning social media companies to execute an operation to discredit it. According to internal documents released by Elon Musk upon his acquisition of Twitter, the FBI and other intelligence community members essentially directed the platform's censorship operation, in part externally by working with top management and in part internally by social media companies hiring eye-popping members of agency alumni. Journalist Michael Schallenberger reported, based on documents he obtained from Musk, that during all of 2020, the FBI and other law enforcement agencies repeatedly primed Twitter executives to dismiss the report of Hunter Biden's laptop as a Russian hack and leak operation, said he arranged for top secret security clearances to be granted to Twitter management, and even had encrypted messaging networks set up, which suggested virtual war rooms. <laughs> to this day, hundreds of people from the intelligence community work at social media companies. Over the last few years, my reporting has been confirmed by virtually every mainstream media outlet, from the Washington Post to the New York Times to Politico, the mistake for nothing, by the way, a few years later. No one denies that the laptop is real, that the origin story is exactly what I told you it was in the first place. This elaborate censorship conspiracy wasn't because the information being reported on was false. It was because it was true, and it was a threat to the power centers in this country. Like this relationship between the U.S. government officials. They don't censor lies. That you just have to keep remember. You, if you can lie all day long, they're not going to censor you for lying. That's what the news does. That's what this is. This whole story about Hunter Biden's laptop shows that the mainstream media lies in conjunction with the intelligence community and the establishment power centers in the Republican and Democratic Party. That's what this was. Well, I think the great Sam Harris said it's because Toby wrote an editorial. I don't care if he's got uh, two different things, but I mean, he doesn't care. It's Toby the great Sam Harris quote. That's the great Sam Harris said. You will see the Sam Harris quote. <laughs> so again, at 100%, everything she said was true, and she was detailing how that they all worked. It was just like they were on the same company, the FBI and Big Pharma and social media people. Mm -hmm. cool, cool. Those are the very definition of fascism. There's no way. It's the definition of fascism. Somehow cool. voting Democrat is going to play by democracy. Cool. Your democracy was stolen from you decades ago. So here we go. And American corporations represent this country, an unprecedented place to undermine the First Amendment, the right to think, write, read, say, whatever we want. And how we respond will determine whether we see a free press as alienable or as optional. Yes. Is alienable or optional? You see what I mean by doing it right? We decided that. Yeah. We haven't decided. It's optional. So here it is. The Hunter Biden story is Russian disinformation. Dozens of <laughs> former intelligence officials. This is the story she was laughing wow. about. So you can't trust most of them. More than 50 former senior intelligence officers have signed on to a letter outlining their belief that the recent disclosure of emails allegedly belonging to Joe Biden's son has all the classic airmarks of Russian information yeah. out there. They just printed it. That's 50 worthless scumbags huh? that work for the government doing God knows what. And, now they're, <laughs> and they, they just print it uncritically, unskeptically, nothing. They just repeat it. Why wouldn't they? Who is the person who wrote this? Oh, it's not Tasha Bertrand. Oh, she's the worst. Yeah. She's the, you know she works directly for the CIA. Well, I want to see the wide-eyed, crazy lady behind her puppeting her while she says it. <laughs> Tasha Burke, she's the worst. So these are all like uh, shared, like you know. So and here and here and here is um, Mark Zuckerberg talking about how the FBI primed him to to censor it and intimidated him to censor. Here we go. How do you guys handle when when there are <laughs> a big news item? controversial like there was a lot of attention on twitter during the election because there's a hunter biden laptop story the new york yeah, post yeah. yeah so you guys censored that as well so we took a different path than twitter um i mean basically the background here is the fbi basically came to us 
that it's since been placed on appeal mm -hmm. in the case. Um, just so you know, like you should be on high alert. There was we, we, we thought there was a lot of Russian propaganda in the 2016 election. We have been on notice that basically there's about to be some kind of jump of, of, um, uh, of that's similar to that. So just be vigilant. So our protocol is different from Twitter's. What Twitter did is they said you can't share this data. Um, we didn't do that. What, what we do is we have, um, if something is reported to us as potentially um, misinformation, important misinformation, we, we also do third party fact checking program. We don't want to be deciding what's true and false. Oh, right. yeah. their third party fact checking program is funded by all of us, like Bill Gates and uh, the Rockefeller Foundation, stuff like that. Who funds these third parties? Well, they're the establishment. Well, didn't the fact check be good in the last, and every fact check we've ever had on Facebook on one of our videos has been incorrect, meaning Facebook is wrong. They were wrong about COVID. They were wrong about the laptop. They were wrong about everything. But now people who know me casually or know me well, when they see when I post, post a video on Facebook and it gets flagged as misinformation when it isn't, they think Jimmy Dore is up to no good. What's happened to Jimmy Dore? No, Facebook is full of shit. And you need to bunk them. That's Bill Gates funded fact checking. That's what that is. Okay. Do you want to give me a fact check? For the, I think it was five or seven days when it was basically being, um, being determined whether it was false, um, the distribution on Facebook was decreased, but people were still allowed to share. So you could still share it, you could still consume it. Did um, you say the distribution was decreased? It, it got shared. It, it, doesn't work. it basically, the ranking in newsfeed was a little bit better. So fewer people saw it than would have otherwise. So why, why would you do Why would you do that? Why, why, why you're only saw it if they didn't buy these elections? If it, if you think it's fake, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you ban it? And if you're not sure, why would you still ban it if you're not sure? Because I'm worried about soaking up some more powerful uh, people than me and so we sure they're run down by you. So our reflect is this censorship at the at the behest of the FBI. The side of, of censorship. Yeah. Holy shit. Yeah, you understand who this is. This is a guy who when his daughter his daughter, I think, was born, he tried to name her in Jew after Xi Jinping or something like that. It, his name to like be some good thing to in China. Oh, that's Jim right. Jim was like, don't name your kid that. That's weird. <laughs> that, that's the kind of worm this is that would suck up to anyone for his despicable. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know. It definitely probably worked for some. I, I don't know off the top of my head, but it's it's, it's it's meaningful. But I mean, but basically, a um, a lot of people are still able to share it. We got a lot of complaints that that was the case. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously this is a hyper political issue, so depending on what side of the political spectrum you either think we didn't censor enough or censored it way too much. But, mm -hmm. uh, but we were sort of just black and white about it as, as Twitter. We just mm -hmm. sort of thought, hey look, if, if the FBI, which you know, I still view as a legitimate institution, <laughs> and maybe a, a very professional law institution, <laughs> they come to us and tell us that we need to be on guard about something, then I want to take that seriously. Well, did, did they specifically say we need to oh, be on guard? You would have taken seriously, but now that you've been tricked by them, have you learned your lesson not to do that? Have you learned your lesson? No, we're still very serious. That's that nonsense that they right. all did. So you got tricked by them. It's a great point, sir. But he's a phony, but he's right. pretending to be a little dog. I wish we were joking. Did they specifically say you need to be on guard about that story? I, I, no, I, I don't remember if it was that specifically, but it was... Ha 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 ha, yes, it, if he doesn't remember that, it was. When he says, I don't remember if that was specific. Yeah, yeah, that That's it was. That's worse than if they specifically said it, because it means I better just protect Hunter Biden. Yeah, we right. better just start censoring left and right for Hunter Biden then, right? They didn't say it specifically, but you're doing it anyway? Really? Basically fit the pattern. They basically fit the pattern. Oh, in that it was totally true? In that it was totally true. Look, if that's a point that... Pattern? That's what real. pattern? What pattern are you talking about? The only pattern is that the pattern what you were working with the FBI to suppress the First Amendment rights of Americans. That's the pattern here. Oh, do you mean the pattern of Russian interference? Yes, that's oh, what it is. Oh, point it out to me. Point it out. What, 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 yeah. I've seen it. I've never seen it ever. I mean, I don't say it on here. I don't, uh, I don't think it did that much in the election. So, 
that's the kind of stuff that the mainstream media is ignoring right now, right? So that woman's testimony, that, and the, the whole hundred, I bet you most of the country still thinks the whole laptop was Russian disinformation. Well, apparently it's uh, now uh, some sort of uh, sixth sense type of power to just see a thing right in front of your goddamn face. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And see, our live shows are going to be in Chicago, Rosemont, Las Vegas, Salt Lake City, New York City, Pottstown, Pennsylvania. Nie ma odsypać, nie ma odsypać. Nie ma odsypać, koko. 
Pojď, mi tohle stočí. Mě tohle stočí, pojď. Pojď mi tohle stočí. Oh, I'm going to go to the other one. 